Chapter One of Fighting the Flames. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel. Fighting the Flames by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter One. How the fight began. One's own fireside is, to all well-regulated minds, a pleasant subject of contemplation when one is absent, and a source of deep gratification when present. Especially may this be said to be the case in a cold, raw night in November, when mankind has a tendency to become chronically cross out of doors, and nature generally looks lugubrious, for just in proportion as the exterior world grows miserably chill, the world at home, with its blazing gas, its drawn curtains, its crackling fires, and its beaming smiles, becomes doubly comfortable and cosy. Even James Auberly, pompous, stern, and ungenial though he was, appeared to entertain some such thoughts, as he sat by his own fireside one such night in his elegant mansion in Beverly Square, Euston Road, London, and smiled grimly over the top of the Times newspaper at the fire. Mr. Auberly always smiled, when he condescended to smile, grimly. He seldom laughed. When he did so, he did it grimly, too. In fact, he was a grim man altogether, a gaunt, cadaverous, tall, careworn, middle-aged man, also a great one. There could be no question as to that, for besides being possessed of wealth, which in the opinion of some minds constitutes greatness, he was chairman of a railway company, and might have changed situations with the charwoman who attended the head office of the same, without much difference being felt. He was also a director of several other companies, which, fortunately for them, did not appear to require much direction in the conduct of their affairs. Mr. Auberly was also leader of the fashion in his own circle, and an oracle among his own parasites, but strange to say he was nobody whatever in any other sphere. Cabmen, it is true, appeared to have an immense respect for him on first acquaintance, for his gold rings and chains bespoke wealth, and he was a man of commanding presence, but their respect never outlived a first engagement. Cabmen seldom touched their hats to Mr. Auberly on receiving their fare, they often parted from him with a smile as grim as his own and once a peculiarly daring member of the fraternity was heard blandly to request him to step again into the cab, and he would drive him the nine hundred and ninety-ninth part of an inch that was still due on the odd sixpence. That generous man even went further, and when his fare walked away without making a reply, he shouted after him that, if he'd only do him the honour to come back, he'd throw an inch and a half extra for nothing. But Mr. Auberly was inexorable. "'Louisa, dear,' said Mr. Auberly, recovering from the grim smile which had indicated his appreciation of his own fireside, "'pour me another cup of coffee, and then you had better run away to bed. It is getting late.' "'Yes, Papa,' replied a little dark-eyed, dark-haired girl, laying down her book and jumping up to obey the command. It may be added that she was also dark-dressed, for Mr. Auberly had become a widower and his child motherless only six months before.' While Louisa was pouring out the coffee, her father rose and turned his back to the fire. It was really interesting, almost awe-inspiring, to behold Mr. Auberly rise. He was so very tall and so exceedingly straight. So remarkably perpendicular was he, so rigidly upright, that a hearty but somewhat rude sea-captain, with whom he once had business transactions, said to his mate on one occasion that he believed Mr. Auberly must have been born with a handspike lashed to his backbone. Yes, he was wonderfully upright, and it would have been downright madness to have doubted the uprightness of the spirit which dwelt in such a body. So nobody did doubt it, of course, except a few jaundiced and skeptical folk, who never could be got to believe anything. "'Good night, my love,' said Mr. Auberly, as the child placed the coffee beside his chair, and then advanced somewhat timidly, and held up her cheek to be kissed. The upright man stooped, and there was a shade less of grimness in his smile as his lips touched his daughter's pale cheek. Louisa, or, to use the name by which she was better known in the house, Lou, had clasped her hands tightly together while she was in the act of receiving this tribute of parental affection, as if she were struggling to crush down some feeling. But the feeling, whatever it was, would not be crushed down. It rose up and asserted itself, by causing Lou to burst into a passionate flood of tears, throw her arms around her father's neck, and hold him tight there while she kissed his cheek all over. "'Tut, tut, child!' exclaimed Mr. Auberly, endeavouring to rearrange the stiff collar and cravat, which had been sadly disordered. 
"'You must really try to get over these. "'There, don't be cast down,' he added, in a kinder tone, patting Lou's head. "'Good night, dear. Run away to bed now and be a good girl.' Lou smiled faintly through her tears as she looked up at her father, who had again become upright, said, "'Good night,' and ran from the room with a degree of energy that might have been the result of exuberant spirits, though possibly it was caused by some other feeling. Mr. Arberley sat for some time, dividing his attentions pretty equally between the paper, the fire, and the coffee, until he recollected having received a letter that day which he had forgotten to answer, whereupon he rose and sat down before his writing-table to reply. The letter was from a poor widower, a sister-in-law of his own, who had disgraced herself forever, at least in Mr. Auberly's eyes, by having married a waterman. Mr. Auberly shut his eyes obstinately to the fact that the said waterman had, by the sheer force of intelligence, good conduct, courage, and perseverance, raised himself to the command of an East India man. It is astonishing how firmly some people can shut their eyes, sew them up, as it were, and plaster them over, to some things, and how easily they can open them to others. Mr. Auberly's eyes were open only to the fact that his sister-in-law had married a waterman, and that was an unpardonable sin, for which she was for ever banished from the sunshine of his presence. The widow's letter set forth that since her husband's death she had been in somewhat poor circumstances, though not in absolute poverty, for which she expressed herself thankful, that she did not write to ask for money, but that she had a young son, a boy of about twelve, whom she was very anxious to get into her mercantile house of some sort, and, knowing his great influence, etc., etc., she hoped that, forgetting, if not forgiving, the past, now that her husband was dead, he would kindly do what he could, etc., etc. To this Mr. Auberly replied that it was impossible to forgive the past, but he would do his best to forget it, and also to procure a situation for her son, though certainly not in his own office, on one consideration, namely, that she, the widow, should forget the past also, including his own, Mr. Auberly's existence, as she had once before promised to do, and that she should never inform her son, or any other member of the family, if there happened to be any other members of it, of the relationship existing between them, nor apply to him by visit or by letter for any further favours. In the event of her agreeing to this arrangement, she might send her son to his residence on Beverly Square, on Thursday next, between eleven and twelve. Just as he concluded this letter, a footman entered softly, and laid a three-cornered note on the table. "'Stay, Hopkins, I want you,' said Mr. Auberly, as he opened the note and ran his eye over it. Hopkins, who was clad in blue velvet and white stockings, stood like a mute beside his master's chair. He was very tall and very thin and very red in the nose. "'Is the young woman waiting, Hopkins?' "'Yes, sir, she's in the lobby. "'Send her up.' In a few seconds Hopkins reopened the door and looked down with majestic condescension on a smart young girl whom he ushered into the room. "'That will do. You may go. Stay. Post this letter. Come here, young woman.' The young woman, who was evidently a respectable servant girl, approached with some timidity. "'Your name is Mattie Marion, I understand. Yes, sir. At least so. Your late mistress, Miss Tippet, informs me. Pray, what does Matty stand for? Martha, sir. Well, Martha, Miss Tippet gives you a very good character, which is well, because I intend you to be servant to my child, her maid. But Miss Tippet qualifies her remarks by saying that you are a little careless in some things. What things are you careless in? La, sir. You must not say la, my girl, interrupted Mr. Auberly with a frown, nor use exclamations of any kind in my presence. What are the some things referred to? "'Sure I do know, sir,' said the abashed Matty. "'I suppose there's a many things I ain't very good at. "'But please, sir, I don't mean to do nothing wrong, sir. "'I don't indeed, and I'll try to serve you well, sir, "'if I were only to please my missus, "'as I'm leaving against my will, for I love my—' "'There, that will do,' said Mr. Auberly, "'somewhat sternly, as the girl appeared to be getting excited. "'Ring that bell. "'Now go downstairs, and Hopkins will introduce you to my housekeeper, "'who will explain your duties to you.' Hopkins entered and solemnly marched Martha Marion to the regions below. Mr. Auberly locked away his papers, pulled out his watch, round it up, and then, lighting a bedroom candle, proceeded with much gravity upstairs. He was a very stately-looking man, and strikingly dignified as he walked upstairs to his bedroom, slowly and deliberately, as though he were marching at his own funeral to the tune of something even deader than the dead march in Saul. 
it is almost a violation of propriety think of mr auberly doing such a very undignified thing as going to bed yet truth requires us to tell that he did it that he undressed himself as other mortals do that he clothed himself in the wonted ghostly garment and that when his head was last seen in the act of closing the curtains around him there was a conical white cap on it tied with a string below the chin and ornamented on the top with a little tassel which waggled as though it were bidding a triumphant and final adieu to, to human dignity half an hour later mrs rose the housekeeper a matronly good-looking woman with very red cheeks was busy in the study explaining to matty marian her duties she had already shown her all over the house and was now at the concluding lesson look here now marian began the housekeeper oh please don't call me marian i ain't used to it call me matty do now very well matty continued mrs rose with a smile i have no objection you irish are a strange race now look here this is master's study and mind he's very particular dreadful particular she paused and looked at her pupil as if desirous of impressing this point deeply on her memory he don't like his papers or books touched not even dusted so you'll be careful not to dust them or touch him even so much as with your little finger for he likes to find him in the morning just as he left them at night yes mrs rose said matty who was evidently giving up her whole soul to the instruction that was being imparted now continued the housekeeper the arranging of this room will be your last piece of work at night you'll just come in rake out the grate carry off the ashes lay the new fire put the matches handy on the chimney-piece look round to see that's all right and then turn off the gas the master is an early riser and lights the fire hisself of the morn yes m said matty with a courtesy now go and do it said mrs rose that i may see you understand it begin with the grate and the ashes matty who was in truth an experienced maid of all work began with alacrity to discharge the duties of her new station she carried off the ashes and returned with the materials for next day's fire and a shovel here she gave a slight indication of her so-called carelessness awkwardness would have been more appropriate by letting two or three pieces of stick and a bit of coal fall on the carpet in her passage across the room be careful matty said mrs rose gently it's all owing to haste take your time and you won't do such things matty apologized picked up the materials and laid the fire then she took her apron and approached the writing-table evidently with the intention of taking the dust off the corners but not by any means intending to touch the books or papers stop cried mrs rose sternly matty stopped with a guilty look not a touch said mrs rose not even the edges nor the legs inquired the pupil neither edges nor legs said the instructor sure it could do no harm matty said mrs rose solemnly the great thing that your countrywomen have to learn is obedience thank ye said matty who being overawed by the housekeeper's solemnity felt confused and was uncertain whether the reference to her countrywomen was complimentary or the reverse now continued mrs rose the matches matty placed the box of matches on the chimney-piece very well now you've got to look round to see that's all right Matty looked round on the dark portraits that covered the walls, supposed to be ancestors, on the shelves of books, great and small, new and old, supposed to be read, on the vases, statuettes, chairs, tables, desks, curtains, papers, etc., etc., and being utterly ignorant of what constituted right and wrong in reference to such things, finally turned her eyes on Mrs. Rose with an innocent smile. "'Don't you see that the shutters are neither shut nor barred, Matty?' she had not seen this but she at once went and closed and barred them in which operation she learned first that the bars refused to receive their respective catches with unyielding obstinacy for some time and second that they suddenly gave in without rhyme or reason and pinched her fingers severely now then what's next inquired mrs rose put out the gas suggested matty and leave yourself in the dark said the housekeeper in a tone of playful irony ah sure didn't i forget the candle in order to rectify this oversight matty laid the unlighted candle which she had brought with her to the room on the writing-table and going to the chimney-piece returned with the match-box be careful now matty said mrs rose earnestly there's nothing to have such a fear of as fire you can't be too careful this remark made matty who was of an anxious temperament extremely nervous she struck the match hesitatingly and lighted the candle shakily of course it would not light candles never do on such occasions and a long red-hot end of burnt wood projected from the point of the match 
"'Don't let the burnt end drop into the waste-paper basket!' exclaimed Mrs. Rose in an unfortunate moment. "'Where?' exclaimed Matty, with a start that sent the red-hot end into the centre of a mass of papers. "'There, just at your feet. Don't be so nervous, girl,' cried Mrs. Rose. Matty, in her anxiety not to drop the match, at once dropped it into the waste-paper basket, which was instantly alight. A stamp of the foot might have extinguished it, but this did not occur to either of the domestics. The housekeeper, who was a courageous woman, seized the basket in both hands and rushed with it to the fireplace, thereby fanning the flame into a blaze and endangering her dress and curls. She succeeded, however, in cramming the basket and its contents into the grate. Then the two, with the aid of poker, tongs, and shovel, crushed and beat out the fire. "'There! I said you'd do it!' gasped Mrs. Rose, as she flung herself, panting, into Mr. Auberly's easy chair. "'This comes of being in a hurry!' "'I was always unfortunate,' sighed Matty, still holding the shovel and keeping her eye on the grate, as if ready to make a furious attack on the smallest spark that should venture to show itself. "'Come now, we'll go to bed,' said Mrs. Rose, rising. "'But first look well round to see that all is safe.' A thorough and most careful investigation was made of the basket, the grate, and the carpet surrounding the fireplace, but nothing beyond the smell of burnt papers should be discovered, so the instructor and pupil put out the gas, shut the door, and retired to the servants' hall, where Hopkins, the cook, the housemaid, and a small maid of all work awaited their arrival, supper being already on the table. Here Mrs. Rose entertained the company with a graphic, not to say exaggerated, account of the small fire in the study, and wound up with an eloquent appeal to be aware of fire, and an assurance that there was nothing on the face of the whole earth that she had a greater horror of. Meanwhile the little spark among the papers, forgotten in the excitement of the succeeding blaze of the waste-paper basket, continued to do its slow but certain work. Having fallen on the cloth between two bundles it smouldered until it reached a cotton pen-wiper, which received it rather greedily in its embrace. The pen-wiper lay in contact with some old letters which were dry and tindery in their nature and being piled closely together in a heap, afforded enlarged accommodation for the spark, which in about half an hour became quite worthy of being termed a swell. After that things went on like, like a house on fire, if we may venture to use that too often misapplied expression, in reference to the elegant mansion in Beverly Square on that raw November night. End of chapter 1《ハプチューオフファイティングフレームズ》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel. Fighting the Flames by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter 2. Another Little Spark. Whistling is a fine, free, manly description of music, which costs little and expresses much. In all its phases, whistling is an interesting subject of study whether we regard its aptitude for expressing personal independence, recklessness, and jollity, its antiquity, having begun no doubt with, with Adam, or its modes of production, as, when created grandly by the whistling gale, or exasperatingly by the locomotive, or gushingly by the lark, or sweetly by the little birds that warble in the flowering thorn. The peculiar phase of this time-honoured music to which we wish to draw the reader's attention at present is that to which was exemplified one November night, the same November night of which mention has been made in the previous chapter, by a small boy who, in his progress through the streets of London, was arrested suddenly under the shadow of St. Paul's, by the bright glare and the tempting fare of a pastry-cook's window. Being hungry, the small boy, thrusting his cold hands deep into his empty trouser-pockets, turned his fat little face and round blue eyes full on the window, and stared at the tarts and pies like a famishing owl. Being poor, so poor that he possessed not the smallest coin of the realm, he stared in vain, and being light of heart as well as stout of limb, he relieved his feelings by whistling at the food with inexpressible energy. The air selected by the young musician was Jim Crow, a sable melody high in public favor at that time, the familiar strains of which he delivered with shrill and tuneful precision, with intensified as he continued to gaze, until they rose above the din of cabs, vans, and buses, above the housetops, above the walls of the great cathedral, and finally awakened the echoes of its roof, which, coming out from the crevices and cornices where they usually slept, went dancing upwards on the dome, and played around the golden cross that glimmered like a ghost in the dark wintry sky. The music also awakened the interest of a tall policeman whose beat that night chanced to be St. Paul's Churchyard, that sedate guardian of the night, 
observing that the small boy slightly impeded the thoroughfare, sauntered up to him, and just as he reached that point in the chorus where Mr. Crow is supposed to wheel and turn himself about, spun him round and gave him a gentle rap on the head with his knuckles, at the same time advising him to move on. "'Oh!' exclaimed the small boy, looking up with an expression of deep concern on his countenance, as he backed off the pavement. "'I hope I didn't hurt you, Bobby. I really didn't mean to, but accidents will happen, you know, and if you won't keep your knuckles out of a feller's way, why—' "'Come,' muttered the policeman. "'Shut up your potato trap for fear you catch cold. Your mother wants you. She's got some pop ready for you.' "'Ha!' exclaimed the small boy, with his head on one side, as though he were critically expecting the portrait of some curious animal. "'A prophet it is, a blue-coated prophet in brass buttons, all but choked with a leather stock, if not conceit. A horacle six foot two in its stockings, I see, Bobby. Whoever brought you up carried you up much too high, both in body and notions. Who wouldn't they give him for him in the guards, or the hoss marines, if he was only eight inches wider across the shoulders?' Seeing that the policeman passed slowly and gravely on without condescending to take further notice of him, the small boy bade him an affectionate farewell, said that he would not forget to mention him favorably at headquarters, and then continued his progress through the crowded streets at smart pace, whistling Jim Crow at the top of his shrill pipe. The small boy had a long walk before him, but neither his limbs, spirits, nor lips grew weary by the way. Indeed his energy seemed to increase with every step, if one might judge from the easy swagger of his gait and the various little touches of pleasantry in which he indulged from time to time, such as pulling the caps over the eyes of boys smaller than himself, winking at those who were bigger, uttering Indian war-whoops down alleys and lanes that looked as if they could echo, and chaffing all who appeared to be worthy of his attentions. Those eccentricities of humour, however, did not divert his active mind from the frequent and earnest study of the industrial arts, as these were exhibited and exemplified in shop-windows." "'Jolly stuff, that, ain't it?' observed another small boy, in a coat much too long for him, as they met and stopped in front of a chocolate shop at the top of Holborn Hill, where a steam engine was perpetually grinding up such quantities of rich brown chocolate that it seemed quite unreasonable, selfish, and dog in the mangerish of the young man behind the counter to stand there, and neither eat it himself, nor let anyone else touch it. "'Yes, it's very jolly stuff,' replied the first small boy, regarding his questioner sternly. I know you'd like some, wouldn't you? Go in now and buy two penn'orth, and I'll buy the half from you when you come out. Walker, replied the boy in the long coat. Just so, and I'd advise you to become a walker, too, retorted the other. Run away now. Your master's been asking after you for half an hour, I know, and more. Without waiting for a reply, the small boy, our small boy, swaggered away, whistling louder than ever. Passing along Holborn, he continued his way into Oxford Street, where the print shop windows proved irresistibly attractive. They seemed also to have the effect of stimulating his intellectual and conceptive faculties, insomuch that he struck out several new, and, to himself, highly entertaining pieces of pleasantry, one of which consisted of asking a taciturn cabman in the meekest of voices, "'Please, sir, you couldn't tell me what's o'clock, could you?' The cabman observed a twinkle in the boy's eye saw through him, in a metaphorical sense, and treated him with silent contempt. "'Oh, I beg pardon, sir,' continued the small boy, in the same meek tone, as he turned to move humbly away. "'I forgot to remember that cabbies don't carry no watches, no, nor chains, neither. They're much too wide awake for that.' A sudden motion of the taciturn cabman caused the small boy to dart suddenly to the other side of the crowded street, where he resumed his easy, independent air and his interrupted tune. "'Can you direct me to Notting Hill Gate, missus?' he inquired of an apple woman, on reaching the neighbourhood of Tottenham Court Road. "'Straight on as you go, boy,' answered the woman, who was busying herself about her stall. "'Very good, indeed,' said the small boy, with a patronising air. "'Quite correctly answered. You've learnt geography, I see.' "'What say?' inquired the woman, who was apparently a little deaf. "'I was asking the price of your oranges, missus.' "'One penny apiece,' said the woman, taking up one. They ain't bowed to make him puff out, are they? To this the woman vouchsafed no reply. Come, missus, don't be cross. What's the price of your apples now? Do you want one? asked the woman testily. Of course I does. Well, then, they're two a penny. Two a penny? cried the small boy with a look of surprise. Why, I just said they was a penny apiece. Good evening, missus. I never buys cheap fruit. Cheap and nasty. No, no. Good evening. It seemed as if the current of the small boy's thoughts had been diverted from this conversation, for he walked for some time with his eyes cast on the ground, 
and without whistling but whatever the feelings were that might have been working in his mind they were too speedily put to flight by a facetious butcher who pulled his hat over his eyes as he passed him now then pig sticker what do you mean by that he shouted but as the butcher walked on without deigning to reply he let off his indignation by yelling in at the open door of a tobacco shop and making off at a brisk run from this point in his progress he became still more hilarious and daring in his freaks and turned aside once or twice into narrow streets where sounds of shouting or music promised him fresh excitement on turning the corner of one of those streets he passed a wide doorway by the side of which was a knob with the word fire in conspicuous letters above it and the word bell below it the small boy paused caught his breath as if a sudden thought had struck him and glanced around the street was comparatively quiet his heart beat high he seized the bell with both hands pulled it full out and bolted now it chanced that one of the firemen of the station happened to be standing close to the door inside at the time he guessing the meaning of the ring at once darted out and gave chase the small boy fled on the wings of terror with his blue eyes starting from their sockets the fireman was tall and heavy but he was also strong and in his prime so that a short run brought him up with the fugitive whom he seized with a grip of iron now then young bottle imp what do you mean by that oh please sir gasped the small boy with a beseeching look i couldn't help it there was such a tone of truthfulness in this couldn't that it tickled the fireman his mouth relaxed in a quiet smile and releasing his intended victim he returned to the station while the small boy darted away in the direction of oxford street he had scarcely reached the end of the street however when a man turned the corner at full speed and ran him down ran him down so completely that he sent him head over heels into the kennel and passing on darted at the fire bell of the station which he began to pull violently the man was tall and dishevelled partially clad in blue velvet with stockings which had once been white but were now covered from garter to toe with mud one shoe clung to his left foot the other was fixed by the heel in a grating over a cellar window in tottenham court road without hat or coat with his shirt sleeves torn by those unfortunates into whose arms he had wildly rushed with his hair streaming backwards his eyes bloodshot his face pale as marble and perspiration running down his cheeks not even his own most intimate friends would have recognized hopkins the staid soft-spoken polite and gentle hopkins had they seen him that night pulling like a maniac at the fire bell and without doubt hopkins was a maniac that night at least he was afflicted with temporary insanity end of chapter two Chapter Three of Fighting the Flames. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susie. Fighting the Flames by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter Three Fire. Hello, that'll do, man cried the same stalwart fireman who had seized the small boy, stepping out and laying his hand on Hopkins's shoulder. "'Whereabouts is it?' Hopkins heard him not. One idea had burnt itself into the poor man's brain, and that was the duty that lay on him to ring the alarm bell. Seeing this, the fireman seized him and dragged him forcibly, almost lifted him, into the station round the door of which an eager crowd had already begun to collect. "'Calm yourself,' said the stalwart fireman quietly, as he thrust Hopkins down into a chair. "'Consider now. You'll make us too late if you don't speak. Where is it?' Ba, ba, fire yelled Hopkins, gasping and glaring round him on the men, who were quietly putting on their helmets. Hopkins suddenly burst from the grasp of his captor, and, rushing out, seized the bell-handle, which he began to pull more furiously than ever. "'Get her out, Jim,' said the fireman in a low tone to one of his comrades, her being the engine. At the same time he went to the door, and again, seizing Hopkins, brought him back and forced him into a chair while he said firmly, "'Now, then, out with it, man. Where's the fire?' "'Yes!' yes screamed hopkins fire that's it Be beverly blazes square number fire that'll do 
said the fireman, at once releasing the temporary maniac, and going to a book where he calmly made an entry of the name of the square, the hour of the night, and the nature of the call. Two lines sufficed. Then he rose, put on his helmet, and thrust a small hatchet into his belt, just as the engine was dragged to the door of the station. There was something absolutely magnificent in the scene which no pen can describe, because more than half its force was conveyed only by the eye and the ear. The strong contrast between human excitement and madness, coupled with imbecility, and human calmness and self-possession, coupled with vigorous promptitude, was perfect. Just before Hopkins rang his first note of alarm, the station had been wrapped in profound silence, the small boy's interruption having been but a momentary affair. George Dale, the fireman in charge, was seated at a desk in the watch-room, known among firemen as the lobby, making an entry in a diary. All the other men, about thirteen in number, had gone to their respective homes and beds in the immediate neighborhood, with the exception of the two whose turn it was to remain on duty all night. These two, named Baxmore and Corney, with their coats, belts, boots, and caps on, had just lain down on the two low trestle couches and were courting sleep. The helmets of their comrades hung on the wall round the room, with belts and hatchets underneath them. Several pairs of boots also graced the walls, and a small clock whose gentle tick was the only sound that broke the silence of the night. In an outer room the dim form of a spare engine could be seen through the doorway. The instant the bell rang, however, this state of quietude was put to flight. The two men rose from their couches, and Dale stepped to the door. There was no starting up, no haste in their movements, yet there was prompt rapidity. The men, having been sailors, had been trained in the midst of alarms. The questions which were put to Hopkins, as above described, were rapidly uttered. Before they were answered, the two men were ready, and at Dale's order, "'Get her out!' They both vanished. One ran round the corner to the engine-house and knocked up the driver in passing. The other ran from door to door of the firemen's abodes, which were close at hand, and with a loud double ring summoned the sleepers. Before he got back to help the first with the engine, one and another and another door opened, and a man darted out, buttoning braces or coat as he ran. Each went into the station, seized his helmet, belt, and axe from his own peg, and in another moment all were armed cap a pie. At the same instant that the engine appeared at the door, a pair of horses were trotted up. Two men held them. Two others fastened the traces. The driver sprang to his seat. The others leaped to their respective places. Each knew what to do, and did it at once. There was no hurry, no loss of time, no excitement. Some of the men, even while acting with the utmost vigor and promptitude, were yawning away their drowsiness, and in less than ten minutes from the moment the bell first rang, the whip cracked and the fire engine dashed away from the station amid the cheers of the crowd. It may be as well to remark here in passing that the London Fire Brigade had, at the time of which we write, reached a high state of efficiency although it could not stand comparison with the perfection of system and unity of plan which marked the organization and conduct of the brigade of the present day. Mr. Braidwood, the able superintendent, had for many years been training his men on a system, the original of which he had begun and proved in Edinburgh. Modifying his system to suit the peculiarities of the larger field to which he had been translated, he had brought the fire engine establishment which belonged at the time to several insurance companies, to a state of efficiency which rendered it a model and a training school for the rest of the world. And although he had not the advantage of the telegraph or the powerful aid of the land-steam fire engine of the present day, he had men of the same metal as those which compose the force now. The Metropolitan Fire Brigade, as it then existed under the control of the Metropolitan Board of Works, had been carried by its chief. Captain Eyer Massey Shaw, to a condition of efficiency little, if at all, short of perfection, its only fault being, if we may humbly venture a remark, that it was too small both in numbers of engines and men. Now, good reader, if you have never seen a London fire engine go to a fire, you have no conception of what it is. And even if you have seen it, but have not gone with it, 
still you have no idea of what it is. To those accustomed to it, no doubt, it may be tame enough. We cannot tell. But to those who mount an engine for the first time and drive through the crowded thoroughfares of London at a wild tearing gallop, it is probably the most exciting drive conceivable. It beats steeplechasing. It feels like driving to destruction. So wild and so reckless is it. And yet it is not reckless in the strict sense of that word. For there is a stern need be in the case. Every moment, not to mention minutes or hours, is of the utmost importance in the progress of a fire. Fire smolders and creeps at first, it may be, but when it has got the mastery and bursts into flames, it flashes to its work and completes it quickly. At such times, one moment of time lost may involve thousands of pounds, aye, and many human lives. This is well known to those whose profession it is to fight the flames. Hence the union of apparent mad desperation with cool, quiet self-possession in their proceedings. When firemen can work in silence, they do so. No unnecessary word is uttered. No voice is needlessly raised. Likewise, the movements of some beautiful steam engine, which, with oiled pistons, cranks, and levers, does its unobtrusive work in its own little chamber in comparative stillness, yet with a power that would tear and rend to pieces buildings and machinery. So the firemen sometimes bend to their work quietly, though with mind and muscles strung to the utmost point of tension. At other times, like the roaring locomotive crashing through a tunnel or past a station, their course is a tumultuous rush amid a storm of shouting and gesticulation. So was it on the present occasion. Had the fire been distant, they would have had to commence their gallop somewhat leisurely, for fear of breaking down the horses. But it was not far off, not much more than a couple of miles. So they dashed round the corner of their own street at a brisk trot, and swept into Oxford Street. Here they broke into a gallop, and here the noise of their progress began for the great thoroughfare was crowded with vehicles and pedestrians, many of whom were retiring from the theatres and music halls and other places of entertainment. To pass through such a crowd without coming into collision with anything required not only the most dexterous driving, but rendered it necessary that some of the men on the engine should stand up and shout, or rather roar incessantly, as they whirled along, clearing everything out of their way, and narrowly escaping innumerable crashes by a mere hair-breadth. The men, as we said before, having been sailors, seemed to shout with the memory of a boatswain strong upon them, for their tones were pitched in the deepest and gruffest bass key. Sometimes there was a lull for a moment, as a comparatively clear space of a hundred yards or so lay before them. Then their voices rose like the roaring of the gale as a stupid or deaf cabman got in their way, or a plethoric bus threatened to interrupt their furious passage. The cross streets were the points where the chief difficulties met them. There the cab and van drivers turned into or crossed the great thoroughfare, all ignorant of the thunderbolt that was rushing on like a fiery meteor, with its lamps casting a glare of light before, and the helmets of its stern charioteers flashing back the rays of street lamps and windows. For, late though the hour was, all the gin places and tobacconists' shops and many of the restaurants were still open and brightly illuminated. At the corner of Wells Street the crowd of cabs and other vehicles was so great that the driver of the engine began to tighten his reins, and Jim Baxmore and Joe Corney raised their voices to a fierce shout. Cabs, buses, and pedestrians scattered right and left in a marvellous manner. The driver slackened his reins, cracked his whip, and the horses stretched out again. In passing Burner Street, a handsome cab swept round the corner, its dashing driver smoking a cigar in sublime self-satisfaction, and looking carelessly right and left for a fare. This exquisite almost ran into the engine. There was a terrific howl from all the firemen. The cabby turned his smart horse with a bound to one side and lost his cigar in the act, in reference to which misfortune he was heartily congratulated by a small member of the shoeblack brigade while the engine went steadily and sternly on its way. "'There! It shows a light!' observed one of the firemen to Dale as he pointed to a luminous appearance in the sky away to the northeast. Dale was already looking in that direction and made no reply. As they reached Tottenham Court, the driver again checked the pace a little. Yet even at the reduced speed they passed everything like a whirlwind. 
The traffic here was so great that it behooved them to be more cautious. Of course, the more need there was for caution, the more necessity was there for shouting, and the duty of Baxmore and Corney, standing as they did in front of their comrades beside the driver, became severe, but they had good lungs both of them. At the point where Tottenham Court Road cuts Oxford Street, the accumulation of vehicles of all sorts, from a hand-barrow to a furniture van, is usually very great. To one unaccustomed to the powers of London drivers, it would have seemed nothing short of madness to drive full tilt into the mass that blocked the streets at this point. But the firemen did it. They reined up a little, it is true, just as a hunter does in gathering his horse together for a rush at a stone wall. But there was nothing like an approach to stopping. Hey, hey, hey! roared the firemen, Baxmore and Corney high above the rest. A bus lumbered to the left just in time. A hansom sprang to the right, not a moment too soon. A luggage van bolted in a corner street. The pedestrians scattered right and left, and the way was clear. No, not quite clear. The engine had to turn at a right angle here into Tottenham Court Road. Round it went on the two off wheels, and came full swing on a market gardener and a hot coffee woman, who were wheeling their respective barrows leisurely side by side and chatting as they went. The roar that burst from the firemen was terrific. The driver attempted both to pull up and to turn aside. The market gardener dropped his barrow and fled. The hot coffee woman, being of a resolute nature, thrust her barrow by main force on the footpath, and so saved her goods and herself by a hairbreadth, while the barrow of her friend was knocked in pieces. But the effort of the engine driver to avoid this had well nigh resulted in serious consequences. In endeavouring to clear the market gardener, he drew so near to the footpath that in another moment a lamp-post would have been carried away, and the wheels of the engine, in all probability, knocked off had not Joe Corney observed the danger. With a true Irish yell, Joe seized the rein next to him and pulled the horses round almost at a right angle. The nave of the hind wheel just shaved the post as it flew by. The whole thing passed so swiftly that before the market gardener recovered from his consternation, the engine was only discernible in the distance by the sparks that flew from its wheels as it held on its furious way. All along its course a momentary disturbance of London equanimity was created. Families not yet abed rushed to their front windows and, looking out, exclaimed, Ha! The firemen! Tipplers in gin places ran to the door and said, There they go! That's your sort! Hurrah, my hearties! Go it, ye cripples! According to the different stages of inebriation at which they had arrived, and belated men of business stopped to gaze and then resumed their way with thoughts and speculations on fire and fire insurance, more or less deep and serious according to temperament. But the disturbance was only temporary. The families retired to their suppers or beds, the tipplers returned to their tipple, the belated speculators to their dreams, and in a few minutes, no doubt, forgot what they had seen, and forgot, perchance, that they had any personal interest in fire-raising or fire-extinction or fire-prevention or fire in any dangerous shape or form whatever, or indulged in the comforting belief, mayhap, that whatever disasters might attend the rest of the London community, they and their houses being endued with the properties of the salamander, nothing in the shape of fire might, could, would, or should kindle upon them. So true is it that all men think all men mortal but themselves. Do you doubt this, reader? If so, go poll your acquaintance, and tell us how many of them have got rope ladders, or even ropes to escape from their houses should they take fire. How many of them have got hand pumps, or even buckets? place so as to be handy in case of fire. And how many of them have got their houses and furniture insured against fire? Meanwhile the fire engine held on its way, until it turned into Beverly Square, and pulled short in front of the blazing mansion of James Auberly Esquire. Another engine was already at work there. It had come from a nearer station, of the existence of which Hopkins had been ignorant when he set out on his wild race for help. The men of this engine were already doing their work quietly but with perceptible effect, pouring incessant streams of water in at the blazing windows, and watching for the slightest lull in the ferocity of the smoke and flame to attack the enemy at closer quarters. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Fighting the Flames 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susie. Fighting the Flames by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter 4 A Fierce Fight with the Flames. When the small boy, whose name it may be as well to mention, was William, alias Willie, Wilders, saw the fire engine start, as has been already described, his whole soul yearned to follow it, for, in the course of his short life, he had never succeeded in being at the beginning of a fire, although he had often been at the middle and end of one, not a very difficult thing in London, by the way, seeing that there are, on the average, between four and five fires every twenty-four hours. Willie Wilders was of an inquiring disposition. He wanted to know how things were managed at a fire, from the beginning to the end, and he found that the course of true inquiry, like another course we wot of, never did run smooth. Poor Willie's heart was with that engine, but his legs were not. They did their best, but they failed, strong and active though they were, to keep up with the horses. So Willie heaved a bursting sigh and slackened his speed, as he had often done before in similar circumstances, resolving to keep it in sight as long as he could, and trust to his eyesight and to the flames showing a light for the rest. Just as he came to this magnanimous resolve, a strapping young gentleman called a passing cab, leaped in, ordered the driver to follow the engine, and offered double fare if he should keep it in view up to the fire. Willie, being sharp as a needle, at once stepped forward and made as though he would open the door for the gentleman. The youth was already in and the door shut, but he smiled as he shouted to the driver, All right, and tossed a copper to Willie, with the remark, There, you scamp. The copper fell in the mud, and there Willie left it, as he doubled nimbly behind the vehicle and laid hold of it. The cabman did his best to earn his double fare, and thus it came to pass that Willie was in time to see the fireman commencing work. As the young man leaped from the cab, he uttered a cry of surprise and alarm, and rushed towards the crowd of firemen nearest to the burning house without paying his fare. Willie was a little astonished at this, but losing sight of the youth in the crowd, and seeing nothing more of him at the time, he became engrossed in other matters. There were so many men on the ground, however, for just then a third engine dashed up to the scene of conflagration, that it was difficult for the excited boy to appreciate fully what he saw. He got as close to the engine, however, as the policeman would allow him, and observed that a fireplug had been already opened, and over it had been placed a canvas cistern of about a yard long by eighteen inches broad, stretched on an iron frame. The cistern was filled with water to overflowing, and the first engine had placed its suction pipe in it, while from the front of the engine extended the leathern hose that conveyed the water to the burning house. Willie was deeply interested in this, and was endeavoring to solve certain knotty points in his own mind when they were suddenly solved for him by a communicative dustman who stood in the crowd close by, and thus expounded the matter to his inquisitive son. You see, Tommy, the use of the cistern is obvious. See, here's how it lies. If an engine comes up and scrooges its suction under the plug, all the other engines as comes after it has to stand by and do nothing. But by putting a cistern over the plug and letting it fill, another engine, or maybe two more, can ram in its suction and drink away till it's fit to burst, do you see? Willie drank in the information with avidity, and then turned his attention to the front of the engine, to which several lengths of hose, each forty feet long, had been attached. Baxmore and Corney were at the extreme end, screwing on the branch or nozzle by which the stream of water is directed, and Dale was tumbling a half-drunk and riotous navvy head over heels into the crowd, in order to convince him that his services to pump were not wanted, a sufficient number having been procured. A couple of policemen walked this navvy quietly from the scene, as Dale called out, "'Down with her, boys!' 
Pump away, lads, said one of the firemen, interpreting. The volunteers bent their backs, and the white cloud of steam that issued from the burning house showed that the second engine was doing its work well. Immediately after, Dale and his men, with the exception of those required to attend the engine and the branch, were ordered to get out the ladders. He who gave this order was a tall, sinewy man, middle-aged, apparently, and of grave demeanor. His dress was similar to that of the other firemen, but there was an air of quiet, unobtrusive authority about him, which showed that he was a leader. "'We might get on the roof now, Mr. Braidwood,' suggested Dale, touching his helmet as he addressed the well-known chief of the London Fire Engine Establishment. "'Not yet, Dale, not yet. Get inside and see if you can touch the fire through the drawing-room floor. It's just fallen in.' Dale and his men at once entered the floor of the building, dragging the branch and hose along with them, and were lost in smoke. Previous to their arrival of the fire engines, however, a scene had been enacted which Willie Wilders had not witnessed. A fire escape was first to reach the burning house. This was then, and still is, usually the case, owing to the fact that escapes are far more numerous in London than engines so that the former, being always close at hand, often accomplish their great work of saving life before the engines make their appearance. The escape in the immediate neighborhood of Beverly Square was under the charge of conductor Samuel Forrest, a man who, although young, had already saved many lives in the service of the Society for the Protection of Life from Fire. When Forrest reached the field of action, Mr. James Auberly was seen at an upper window in a state of undignified dishabille, shouting for help and half-suffocated with smoke, with Mrs. Rose hanging round his neck on one side and Maddie Marion at the other. Poor Auberly, having tried the staircase on the first alarm, was driven back by smoke and rushed wildly to the window where the two domestics, descending in terror from their attic, clung to him and rendered him powerless. Forrest at once pitched his escape, which was just a huge scientifically constructed ladder set on wheels. The head of it reached to the windows of the second floor. By pulling a rope attached to a lever, he raised a second ladder of smaller size which was fitted to the head of the large one. The top of this second ladder was nearly sixty feet from the ground, and it reached the window at which Mr. Auberly was still shouting. Forrest at once sprang up. "'Leave me! Save the women!' gasped Auberly, as a man entered the room, but the dense smoke overpowered him as he spoke, and he fell forward. The women also sank to the ground." Forrest instantly seized Mrs. Rose in his powerful arms and, hurrying down the ladder to the top of the escape, put her into the canvas trough or sack which was suspended below the ladder all the way. Down this she slid somewhat violently but safely to the ground, while Forrest ran up again and rescued Maddie in the same way. Mr. Auberly was more difficult to manage, being a heavy man and his rescuer was almost overpowered by the thick smoke in the midst of which all this was done. He succeeded, however, but fainted on reaching the ground. It was at this point that the first engine arrived, and only a few minutes elapsed when the second made its appearance, followed by the cab from which the young man leapt with the exclamation of surprise and alarm that had astonished Willie Wilders. Pushing his way to the place where Mr. Auberly and the others lay, the youth fell on his knees. "'My father!' he exclaimed wildly. "'He's all right, lad,' said Mr. Braidwood, coming up at the moment, and laying his hand kindly on the youth's shoulder. "'He's only choked with smoke and will be better in a minute. Any more in the house?' he added quickly. Young Auberly leapt up with a shout. "'My sister! Is she not saved? Are all here?' He waited not for a reply, but in another moment was on the fire escape. "'After him, two of you,' said Braidwood, turning to his men. Two at once obeyed. In fact, they had leapt forward almost before the brief command was uttered. 
One of these firemen was conspicuous for his height and strength. He was first up the ladder. Close upon him followed Baxmore with a lantern. Nothing but smoke had yet reached the room into which young Auberly entered, so that he instantly found himself in impenetrable darkness and was almost choked as well as blinded. "'Have a care, Frank. The floor must be gone about this time,' said Baxmore as he ran after his tall comrade. The man whom he called Frank knew this. He also knew that it was not likely anyone had been left in the room from which the master of the house had been rescued and he thought it probable that his daughter would occupy a room on the same floor with her father. Acting on this supposition, and taking for granted that the room they were about to enter was Mr. Auberly's bedroom, the tall fireman dashed at once through the smoke and tumbled over the prostrate form of young Auberly. "'Look after him, Baxmore!' he gasped as he seized the lamp from his comrade's hand and darted across the room and out into the passage, where he went crash against the door and burst it open. Here the smoke was not so dense, so that he could breathe, though with difficulty. One glance showed him where the bed was. He felt it. A female form was lying on it. The light weight and the long hair which swept across his face as he raised it gently but swiftly on his shoulder told him that it was that of a girl. At that moment he heard a loud shout from the crowd, which was followed by a crash. Dashing once more across the passage, he saw that a lurid flame was piercing the smoke in the other room. The staircase, he knew, was impassable, probably gone by that time. But he had not time to think, so he drew the blanket over the girl's head and bounded towards the window. There was a feeling of softness under his feet, as if the floor were made of pasteboard. He felt it sinking beneath him. Down it went, just as he laid hold of the head of the fire escape, in which he hung suspended in the midst of the smoke and sparks that rose from the falling ruin. Strong though the young fireman was, he could not raise himself by one arm while the other was twined round Louisa Auberly. At that moment Baxmore, having carried young Auberly down in safety, again ascended and appeared at the window. He seized Frank by the hair of the head. "'Let go my hair and catch the girl!' shouted Frank. "'All right!' said Baxmore, seizing Lou and lifting her over the window sill. Frank, being thus relieved, swung himself easily on the sill, and grasping Lou once more, descended to the street, where he was met by Mr. Auberly, who had recovered from a state of partial suffocation, and who seized his child and hurried with her into a neighboring house. Thither he was followed by Mrs. Rose and Mattie, who had also recovered. During these episodes, the firemen had continued at their work with cool and undistracted attention, and here the value of organization was strikingly and beautifully brought out. For, while the crowd swayed to and fro, now breathless with anxiety lest the efforts of the bold conductor of the fire escape should fail, anon wild with excitement and loud in cheers when he succeeded, each fireman paid devoted and exclusive attention to his own prescribed piece of duty as if nothing else were going on around him, and did it with all his might, well knowing that every other piece of work was done, or point of danger guarded, by a comrade, while the eagle eyes of Mr. Braidwood and his not less watchful foreman superintended all, observed and guided, as it were, the field of battle. And truly, good generalship was required, for the foe was fierce and furious. The devouring element rushed onward like a torrent. The house was large and filled with rich furniture, which was luxurious food for the flames as they swept over the walls, twined round the balustrades, swallowed the paintings, devoured the woodwork, and melted metal in their dread progress. But the foe that met them was, on this occasion, more than a match for the flames. It was a hand-to-hand -hand encounter. The men followed them foot by foot, inch by inch sometimes almost singeing their beards or being well-nigh choked and blinded by dense volumes of smoke but if driven back always returning to the charge the heat at times beat on their helmets so fiercely that they were forced to turn their faces aside and half turn their backs on the foe but they always kept their weapons the branches to the front and continued to discharge upon him tons and tons of aqueous artillery "'Get up to the windows now. Use the escape,' said Mr. Braidwood. And as he said this, he passed through the doorway of the burning house. 
some of the men rushed up the escape and let down a line to which one of the branches was made fast avast pumpin number two shouted baxmore from the midst of clouds of smoke that were bursting out from the window number two engine was stopped its branch was pulled up and pointed inside straight at the fire the signal given down with number two and a hiss was followed by volumes of steam the work of extinction had at last begun in real earnest as long as they could only stand in the street and throw water in through the windows at haphazard they might or might not hit the fire and at all events they could not attack its strong points but now baxmore at one window and one of the men at the first engine at another played point-blank into the flames and wherever the water hit they were extinguished presently they got inside and began to be able to see through the smoke a blue glimmer became visible the branch was pointed and it was gone by this time the second floor had partly given way and fire was creeping down the rafters to the eaves of the house baxmore observed this and pointed the branch straight up the fire at that part was put out and a heavy shower of water fell back on the fireman drenching him to the skin the attack had now become general the firemen swarmed in at the doors and windows the moment that it was possible for a human being to breathe the smoke and live one of the engines attached two additional lengths of hose dragged the branch through the first floor to the back of the house got upon an outhouse in at a back window and attacked the foe in rear on the roof frank and dale were plying their hatchets their tall figures sharply defined against the wintry sky and looking more gigantic than usual the enemy saved them the trouble of cutting through however for it suddenly burst upwards and part of the roof fell in it would certainly have taken frank prisoner had not dale caught him by the collar and dragged him out of danger instantly a branch was pointed downwards and the foe was beaten back from above below before and behind it was now met with deluges of water which fell on the shoulders of the men in the lower floor in a continuous hot shower while they stood ankle-deep in hot water in ten minutes after this the fire was effectually subdued the lower floor having been saved although its contents were severely damaged by water it was only necessary now that one of the engines should remain for a time to make good the victory the others rolled up their hose and prepared to depart the king street engine was the first to quit the field of battle while the men were getting ready mr auberly muffled in a long cloak stepped from the crowd and touched frank the tall fireman on the shoulder sir said he in a low voice you saved my child i would show my sense of gratitude will you accept of this purse frank shook his head and a smile played on his smoke begrimed countenance as he said no mr auberly i am obliged to you but i cannot accept of it i do not want it and besides the men of the brigade are not allowed to take money but you will let me do something for you urged mr auberly is there nothing i can do nothing sir said frank he paused for a moment and then resumed well there is something that perhaps you could do sir i have a little brother out of employment if you could get him a situation sir i will said mr auberly with emotion send him to me on thursday forenoon he will find me living next door to my to my late home i shall stay with a friend for some time good night men of king street engine get up cried dale stay what is your name said mr auberly turning round but frank was gone he had leapt to his place on the engine and was off at a rattling pace through the now silent and deserted streets of the sleeping city although they drove on at a great speed there was no shouting now for neither bus cab nor footed passenger blocked up the way and the men begrimed the smoke and charcoal wet and weary with two hours of almost uninterrupted labor of a severe as well as dangerous character sat or stood in their places in perfect silence on reaching the fire station they leapt to the ground and all went quickly and silently to their neighboring homes and beds except the two men on duty 
these changing their coats and boots lay down on the trestles and at once fell fast asleep the engines and horses having been previously housed and then dale sat down to make an entry of the event in his day book the whole thing might have been only a vivid dream so silent was the room and so devoid of any evidence of recent excitement while the reigning tranquillity was enhanced rather than decreased by the soft breathing of the sleepers the ticking of the clock and the scratching of dale's pen as he briefly recorded the facts of the fire that night in beverly square end of chapter four Chapter 5 of Fighting the Flames. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zena Blue. Fighting the Flames by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter 5. During the progress of the fire, small Willie Wilders was in a state of the wildest, we might almost say hilarious, excitement. He regarded not the loss of property. The fire never struck him in that light. His little body and big spirit rejoiced in the whole affair as a magnificent display of fireworks and heroism. When the fire burst through the library windows, he shouted, when Sam Forrest, the conductor of the fire escape, saved Mr. Arberly and the women, he hurrahed. When the tall fireman and Baxmore rescued Louisa Arberly, he cheered and cheered again until his shrill voice rose high above the shouting of the crowd. When the floors gave way, he screamed with delight, and when the roof fell in, he shrieked with ecstasy. Sundry and persevering were the efforts he made to break through the police by fair means and foul, but in his energy he overreached himself, for he made himself so conspicuous that the police paid special attention to him, and wherever he appeared he was snubbed and thrust back, so that his great desire to get close to the men while they were at work was frustrated. Willie had a brother who was a fireman and he wished earnestly that he might recognize him, if present, but he knew that, being attached to the southern district of the city, he was not likely to be there, and even if he were, the men were all so much alike in their uniform that it was impossible at a distance to distinguish one from another. True it is that his brother was uncommonly tall and very strong, but as the London firemen were all picked men, many of them were very tall, and all of them were strong. Not until the last engine left the ground did Willie Wilders think it advisable to tear himself away and hasten to his home in Notting Hill, where he found his mother sitting up for him in a state of considerable anxiety. She forbore to question him that night, however. When Willie appeared the next morning, or rather the same morning, for it was nearly four o'clock when he went to bed, he found his mother sitting by the fire, knitting a sock. Mrs. Wilders was a widow, and was usually to be found seated by the fire, knitting a sock, or darning one, or mending some portion of male attire. "'So you were at the fire last night, Willie,' said the widow. "'Yes, I was,' replied the boy, going up to his mother, and giving her what he styled a roistering kiss which she appeared to like, although she was scarcely able to bear it, being thin and delicately formed, and somewhat weak from bad health. No lives lost, I hope, Willie. No, there ain't often lives lost when Sam Forrest, the fire escape man, is there. You know Forrest, mother, the man that we've heard so much of. Ah, oh, it was such fun. You've no notion. It would have made you split your sides with laughing if you'd have seen Sam come out of the smoke, carrying the master of the house on his shoulder, in his shirt and drawers, with only one sock on, and his nightcap tied so tight under his chin that they had to cut it off. Him in a swoon, too, hanging as limp as a dead eel on Sam's shoulder, with his head down one side and his legs down the other. Oh, it was a bark! 
the boy called the lark to his own mind so vividly that he had to stop at this point in order to give vent to an uproarious fit of laughter was frank there inquired the widow when the fit subsided not that i know of mother i looked hard for him but didn't see him there were lots of men big enough to be him but i couldn't get near enough to see for the bobbies i wonder what them bobbies were made for continued willie with a look of indignation as he seated himself at the table and began to eat a hearty breakfast the long lamp posts that are always in the way when nobody wants em i do believe they was invented for nothing else than to aggravate small boys and snub their inquiring minds where was the fire willie in beverly square i say mother if that there grocer don't send us better stuff than this here bacon in the future i'll i'll have to give em up i can't afford to get better dear said the widow meekly i know that mother but he could afford to give better however it's down now so it don't much matter did you hear whose house was burned willie uh mr oberly or something like that oberly exclaimed the widow with a start well perhaps it is oberly but whichever it is he's got a pretty kettle of fish to look after this morning you seem to have heard of him before mother yes willie i i know him uh at least i have met him often you see i was better off once and used to mingle with but i need not trouble you with that on the strength of our former acquaintance i thought i would write and ask him to get you a situation in an office and i have got a letter from him just before you came down to breakfast saying that he will do what he can and bidding me send you to him between eleven and twelve to-morrow whew whistled willie and he burnt out a house and home without a coat to his back or a shoe to his foot it strikes me i'll have to try to get him a situation he won't be found at the house now i dare say my son so we'll have to wait a little but the burning of his house and furniture won't affect him much for he's rich hm perhaps not said willie but the burning of his little girl might have you said that no lives were lost cried mrs wilders turning pale no more there was mother but if it hadn't been for one of the firemen that jumped in at a blazing window and brought her out through the fire and smoke she'd have been a cinder by this time and money wouldn't have bought that rich man another daughter i know true my son observed mrs wilders resting her forehead on her hand then as if suddenly recollecting something she looked up and said willie i want you to go down to the city with these socks to frank this is his birthday and i sat late last night on purpose to get them finished his station is a long way off i know but you've nothing else to do so nothing else to do mother exclaimed willie with an offended look haven't i got to converse in a friendly way with all the crossing sweepers and shoebacks and stall women as i go along and chaff the cabbies and look in at all the shop windows and insult the bobbies i always insult the bobbies it does me good i hurt em mentally as much as i can and i'd hurt em bodily if i could but every dog has his day when i grow up i won't i pinch into him he struck the table with his fist and shaking back his curly hair lifted his blue eyes to his mother's face with a stern expression which gradually relaxed into a smile ah uh, you needn't grin mother and tell me that the policemen are a fine set of men and quite as brave and useful in their way as the firemen i know all you respectable sort of people think that but i don't they're my natural enemies and i hate em come mother give me the socks and let me be off soon the vigorous archim was on his way to the city whistling as usual with all his might as he passed the corner of the british museum a hand touched him on the shoulder and its owner said how much a year are you paid a week lad for kicking up such a row willie looked round and his eyes encountered the brass knuckle 
of the waist belt of a tall strapping fellow in blue uniform glancing upwards he beheld the handsome countenance of his brother frank looking down at him with a quiet smile he wore no helmet for except when attending a fire the firemen wear a sailor-like blue cap hello blazes is that you cried the boy just so willie going down to watling stream to attend drill willie who had styled his brother blazes ever since he joined the fire brigade observed that he happened to be going in the same direction to deliver a message from his mother to a relation which he would not speak about however just then as he wished to tell him of a fire he'd been at last night a fire lad was it a big one ay hey, that it was a case of burning out almost and there were lives saved said the boy with a look of triumph and that's more than you can say you've seen though you are a fireman well you know i have not been long in the brigade willie and as the escapes often do their work before the engines come up i have not had much chance yet of seeing lives saved how was it done with glowing eyes and flushed cheeks, Willie at once launched out into a vivid description of the scene he had so recently witnessed, and dwelt particularly on the brave deeds of Conductor Forrest and the tall fireman. Suddenly he looked up at his brother. "'Why, what are you chuckling at, Blazes?' "'Nothing, lad. Was the fireman very tall?' "'That he certainly was, uncommon tall.' something like me said frank a gleam of intelligence shot across the boy's face as he stopped and caught his brother by the sleeve saying earnestly it wasn't you frank was it it was willie and right glad am i to have been in such good luck as to save miss arvilly willie grasped his brother's hand and shook it heartily you're a brick blazes said he and this is your birthday and i wish you luck and long life my boy you'll do me credit yet if you go on as you've begun now i'll go right away back and tell mother won't she be fit to burst but what about your message to the relation in the city inquired frank that relation is yourself and here's the message in the shape of a pair of socks for mother knitted with her own hands and by the way that reminds me how came you to be at the fire last night it's a long way from your station i have been changed recently said frank poor grove was badly hurt about the loins at a fire in new bond street last week and i have been sent to take his place so i'm at the king street station now but i have something more to tell you before you go lad so walk with me a bit farther Willie consented, and Frank related to him his conversation with Mr. Arverly, in reference to himself. I thought of asking leave and running out this afternoon to tell you, so it's as well we have met, as it will. Why, what are you chuckling at, Willie? The question was put in consequence of the boy's eyes twinkling and his cheeks reddening in suppressed merriment. Never mind, Blazes. I haven't time to tell you just now. I'll tell you some other time. So, old Arberly wants to see me tomorrow forenoon. That's what he said to me, returned Frank. Very good. I'll go. Adieu, Blazes. Farewell. So saying, Willie Wilders turned round and went off at a run, chuckling violently. He attempted to whistle once or twice but his mouth refused to retain the necessary information. So he contented himself with chuckling instead. And it is worthy of record that a small boy was so much engrossed with his own thoughts on this particular occasion that he did not make one observation, bad, good, or indifferent, to anyone during his walk home. He even received a question from a boy smaller than himself as to whether his mother knew he was out, without making any reply and passed innumerable policemen without even a thought of vengeance. "'Let me see,' said he, muttering to himself as he paused beside the marble arch at Hyde Park, and leaned his head against the railings of that structure. "'Mr. Arberley has been and ordered two boys to be sent to him tomorrow forenoon. Ha! Heh! 
Sk! The chuckling got the better of him here. Very good. And my mother has ordered one of the boys to go, while tall fireman has ordered the other. Now, the question is, which of the two boys am I? The one or the other? Ha! <laughs> Sk! Well, of course, both of the boys will go. They can't help it. There's no getting over that. But then, which of them will get the situation? There's a scruncher for you, Mr. Arberly. You'll have to fill your house with tar and turf of time, and set fire to it over again, before you'll throw light on that pint. Suppose I should go in for both situations. It might be managed. The first boy could take a well-paid situation as a clerk. And the second boy might go in for a night watchman at a bank. Chuckling again interrupted the flow of thought. Perhaps the two situations might be got in the same place of business. That would be handy. Oh, if one of the boys could only be a girl. What a lark that would... <laughs> he was interrupted at this point by a shoe black, who remarked to his companion, I say, Bob, here's a lark. Here's a feller been out and got no bedlam and larfin at nothing fit to burst hisself. So Willie resumed his walk with a chuckle that fully confirmed the member of the Black Brigade in his opinion. He went home chuckling and went to bed chuckling, without informing his mother of the cause of his mirth. Chuckling, he arose on the following morning, and chuckling still, went at noon to Beverly Square, where he discovered Mr. Arberly standing, gaunt and forlorn, in the midst of the ruins of his once elegant mansion. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Fighting the Flames This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zena Blue. Fighting the Flames by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter 6. Well, boy, what do you want? Have you anything to say to me? Mr. Arberly turned sharp round on Willie, whose gaze had gone beyond the length of simple curiosity. In fact, he was awestruck at the sight of such a very tall and very dignified man, standing so grimly in the midst of such dreadful devastation. "'Please, sir, I was sent to you, sir, by—' "'Oh, you're the boy, the son of—that is to say, you were sent to me by your mother,' said Mr. Arberly with a frown. "'Well, sir,' replied Willie, hesitating, "'I—I I was sent—' By by Ah, I see, interrupted Mr. Arberly with a smile that was meant to be gracious. You were sent by a fireman. You are not the, the, I mean, you're the other boy. Poor Willie, being of a powerfully risable nature, found it hard to contain himself on hearing his own words of the previous evening, re-echoed thus unexpectedly. His face became red, and he took refuge in blowing his nose, during which process, having observed the smile on Mr. Arberly's face, he resolved to be the other boy. "'Yes, sir,' he said, looking up modestly. "'I was sent by a fireman. I am the other boy.' Mr. Arberly smiled again grimly, and said that the fireman was a brave fellow, and that he had saved his daughter's life and that he was very glad to do anything that lay in his power for him and that he understood that willie was the fireman's brother to which the boy replied that he was well then come this way continued mr auberly leading willie into the library of the adjoining house which his friend had put at his disposal and seating himself at a writing table you want a situation of some sort a uh, clerkship i suppose Willie admitted that his ambition soared to that tremendous height. "'Let me see,' muttered Mr. Auberly, taking up a pen and beginning to write. "'Yes, she will help me. What is your name, boy?' "'Willie, sir.' "'Just so, William,' 
And your surname, your other name. Wilder, sir. Mr. Auberly started and looked Willie full in the eyes. Willie, feeling that he was playing a sort of double part without being able to avoid it, grew red in the face. What did you say, boy? Wilders, replied Willie stoutly. Then you're not the other boy, said Mr. Auberly, laying down his pen and regarding Willie with a frown. Please, sir, replied Willie, with a look of meekness which was mingled with a feeling of desperation, for his desire to laugh was strong upon him. Please, sir, I don't rightly know which boy I am. Mr. Arberly paused for a moment. Boy, you're a fool. Thank ye, sir, said Willie. This reply went a long way in Mr. Arberly's mind to prove the sir truth of his assertion. Answer me, boy, said Mr. Arberly, with an impressive look and tone. Were you sent here by a fireman? Yes, sir, replied Willie. What is his name? Same as mine, sir. Wilders. Of course, of course, said Mr. Arberly, a little confused at having put such an unnecessary question. Does your mother know you're here? This brought the slang phrase, does the mother know you're out? so forcibly to the boy's mind that he felt himself swell internally and had recourse again to his pocket handkerchief as a safety valve yes sir said he on recovering his composure arter i saw blazes frank i mean that's my brother sir i goes right away home to bed i stops with my mother sir and she saw me come off here this morning sir she knows i was coming here of course yes yes i see muttered mr arberly again taking up his pen i see yes yes same name strange coincidence though but after all there are many of that name in london i suppose the other boy will be here shortly very odd very odd indeed please sir observed willie in a gentle tone you said i was the other boy sir Mr. Arberly seemed a little annoyed at his muttered words being thus replied to, yet he condescended to explain that there was another boy of the same name whom he expected to see that morning. "'Oh, then there's another boy, sir?' said Willie with a look of interest. "'Hold your tongue,' said Mr. Arberly in a sharp voice. "'You're a fool. You're much too fond of speaking. I advise you to keep your tongue quieter if you wish to get on in life. Willie once more sought relief in his pocket handkerchief, while his patron indicted and sealed an epistle which he addressed to Miss Tippet, number six, Porthing Lane, Beverly Square. Here, boy, take this to the lady to whom it is addressed. The lane is at the opposite corner of the square, and wait an answer. Am I to bring the answer back to you, sir? asked Willie with much humility. No. The answer is for yourself, said Mr. Arberly testily. And hark ye, boy, you need not trouble me again. That note will get you all you desire. Thank you, sir, said Willie, making a bow and preparing to retire. But, please, sir, I don't very well know. That is to say, <clears throat> Well, boy, said the patron sternly, excuse me sir i can't help it you know but please sir i wish to explain about that other boy no that's me but the other boy you know be gone boy cried mr arberly in a voice so stern that willie found himself next moment in the street along which he ran chuckling worse than ever a little reflection might have opened mr arberly's eyes to the truth in regard to willie but a poor relation was to him a disagreeable subject of contemplation and he possessed the faculty in an eminent degree of dismissing it altogether from his mind having care enough on his mind at that time poor man he deliberately cast the confusion of the two boys out of his thoughts and gave himself up to matters more interesting and personal we may add here that mrs wilders was faithful to her promise and never more addressed her brother-in-law by word or letter when willie afterwards told her and frank of the absurdity of his interview 
and of the violent manner in which mr arberly had dismissed him when he was going to explain about the other boy his mother thought it best to let things rest as they stood yet she often wondered in her own quiet way what mr arberly would think of her and of the non-appearance of the other boy and she felt convinced that if he only put things together he must come to understand that willie and frank were her sons but mrs wilders did not know the before-mentioned happy facility which her kinsman possessed of forgetting poor relations so after wandering on for a time she ceased to think or wonder about it at all end of chapter six by Zena blue chapter number seven of fighting the flames this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by Zena blue fighting the flames by r m ballantyne chapter seven thoughts in regard to men miss emmelina tippet was a maiden lady of pleasing countenance and exceedingly uncertain age she was a poor member of a poor branch of an aristocratic family and feeling an unconquerable desire to breathe if not the pure unadulterated atmosphere of beverly square at least as much of it as was compatible with a very moderate income she rented a small house in a very dark and dismal lane leading out of that great centre of refinement it is true that beverly square was not exactly the west end but there are many degrees of west endiness so to speak in the western neighbourhood of london and this square was in the opinion of miss tippet the west endiest place she knew because there dwelt in it not only a very genteel and uncommonly rich portion of the community but several of her own aristocratic though distant relations among whom was mr Auberly. the precise distance of the relationship between them had never been defined and all records bearing on it having been lost in the mists of antiquity it could not now be ascertained but miss tippet laid claim to the relationship and as she was an obliging good-humoured chatty and musical lady mr Auberly admitted the claim miss tippet's only weakness for she was indeed a most estimable woman was a tendency to allow rank and position to weigh too much in her esteem she had also a sensitive abhorrence of everything low and vulgar which would have been of course a very proper feeling had she not fallen into the mistake of considering humble birth lowness and want of polish vulgarity a mistake which is often sometimes even wilfully made by persons who consider themselves much wiser than miss tippet but who are not wise enough to see a distinct shade of true vulgarity in their own sentiments the dark dismal lane named poor thing lane besides forming an asylum for decayed and would-be aristocrats in a vestibule as it were to beverly square was a convenient retreat for sundry greengrocers and public housekeepers and small tradespeople who supplied the densely people surrounding district and even some of the inhabitants of beverly square itself with the necessities of life it was also a thoroughfare for the gay equipages of the square which passed through it daily on their way to and from the adjoining stables thereby endangering the lives of precocious babies who could crawl but could not walk away from home as well as affording food for criticism and scandal not to mention the leaving behind of a species of second-hand odor of gentility such as coachmen and footmen can give forth miss tippet's means being small she rented a proportionately small residence consisting of two floors which were the upper portion of a house whose ground floor was a toy shop the owner of the toy shop david boone was miss tippet's landlord but not the owner of the tenement he rented the whole and sublet the upper portion miss tippet's parlor windows commanded a near view of the lodging opposite into every corner and crevice of which she could have seen had not the windows been encrusted in impenetrable dirt her own domestic arrangements were concealed from view by small green venetian blinds which rose from below and met the large venetians which descended from above 
the good lady's bedroom windows in the upper floor commanded a near view much too near of a stack of chimneys between which and another stack farther over she had a glimpse of part of the gable end of a house in the topmost bough of a tree in beverly square it was this prospect into paradise terrestrially speaking that influenced miss tippet in the choice of her abode when william wilders reached the small door of number six porting lane and raised his hand to knock the said door opened as if it had been trained to admit visitors of its own accord and miss mattie marion issued forth followed by a bright blue-eyed girl of about twelve years of age well boy was ye comin here inquired mattie as the lad stepped aside to let them pass yes i was does miss tippet live here she does boy what do you want with her i want to see her young ooman so you'd better cut up away and tell her gentleman request a few words private conversation with her the little girl laughed at this speech and mattie addressing william as a dirty spalpeen said he had better go with her to a shop first and she'd then take him back and introduce him to miss tippet you see i can't let ye and all be yer alone kushla for what would the neighbors say you know i'm only going to the toy shop and won't kape ye a minute for miss emma don't take long to her bargains willie might probably have demurred to this delay but on hearing that the blue-eyed girl wanted to make purchases he went once agreed to the proposal and followed them into the toy shop david boone who stepped out of the back shop to serve them was if we may say so very unlike his trade a grave tall long-legged long-nosed raw-boned melancholy-looking creature such as he might have been an undertaker or a mute or a sexton or a policeman or a horse guardsman or even a lawyer but it was the height of impropriety to have him a toy shopman and whoever did it had no notion whatever of the fitness of things one could not resist the idea that his clumsy legs would certainly upset the slender wooden toys with which the floor and counters were covered and his fingers seemed made to break things the figure of punch which hung from the ceiling appeared inclined to hit him as he passed to and fro and the pretty little dolls with the sweet pink faces and very flaxen hair and cerulean blue eyes were evidently laughing at him nevertheless david boone was a kind-hearted man very fond of children and extremely unlike in some respects what people imagined him at first sight to be well miss ward what can i supply you with to-day said he blandly please mr boone i want a slate and a piece of slate pencil emma looked up with a sweet smile at the tall shopman who looked down upon her with grave benignity as he produced the articles required do you cape turpentine said mattie as they were about to quit the shop boone started and said almost toastily no i don't why do you ask sure there's no sin in asking replied mattie in surprise at the man's changed manner of course of course not rejoined boone with a slight look of confusion as he made a sudden assault with his pocket handkerchief on the cat which was sleeping innocently in the window get out of that you brute you're always a goin on the window capsizin things there you been and sat on the face of that air wax doll till you almost melted it out of that with you no miss marion he added turning to the girl with his wonted urbanity i don't keep turpentine i was only surprised you should ask for it in a toy shop but you'll get it of mr white next door i don't believe there's anything in the world he can't supply to his customers david boone bowed them out and then re-entered the back shop shaking his head slowly from side to side i don't like it i don't even like to think of it gorman he said to a big low-brow man who sat smoking his pipe beside the little fireplace the fire in which was so small that its smoke scarcely equaled in volume that of the pipe he smoked no i don't like it and i won't do it well well you can please yourself said gorman knocking the ashes out of his pipe and placing it in his vest pocket as he rose and buttoned his thick pea jacket up to the chin 
that i'll tell you what it is if you are a descendant of the hunter of the far west that you boast so much about it's precious little of his pluck that you got and so i'll tell you to your face david boone all i've got to say that you'd better be wise and take my advice and think better of it so saying gorman went out and slammed the door after him meanwhile miss mattie marion having purchased a small file of turpentine returned to number six and ushered willie wilders into the presence of her mistress miss emmeline tippet was neither tall nor stiff nor angular nor bony on the contrary she was little and plump and not bad-looking and people often wondered why miss tippet was miss tippet it was not mrs somebody else whatever the reason was miss tippet never divulged it so we won't speculate about it here a note boy for mr arberly exclaimed miss tippet with a beaming smile give it to me thank you she opened it and read attentively while master willie glanced around the parlor and took mental notes miss emma ward sat down on a stool in the window ostensibly to do sums but really to draw faces all of which bore a strong caricatured resemblance to willie at whom she glanced slyly over the top of her slate Mattie remained standing at the door to hear what the note was about. She did not pretend to busy herself about anything. There was no subterfuge in Mattie. She had been Miss Tippett's confidential servant before entering the service of Mr. Arberly, and her extremely short stay in Beverly Square had not altered that condition. She had come to feel that she had a right to know all Miss Tippett's affairs, and so waited for information. Ah! exclaimed Miss Tippett, still reading. Yes, get him a situation in your brother's office. Oh, certainly, I'll be sure to get that. He seems smart. I must always say impute. <clears throat> yes, well. Boy, said Miss Tippet, turning suddenly to Willie, your name is William Wilders, I believe. Yes, ma'am. Well, William, Mr. Arberly, my relative, asked me to get you into my brother's my brother's what's his name office of course i shall be happy to try i am always extremely happy to do anything for yes i suppose of course you can write and what do you call it count and uh, you can do arithmetic yes ma'am replied willie and you can spell eh i hope you can spell edward uh i mean thomas or is it william miss tippet looked at willie so earnestly and put this question in tones so solemn that he was much impressed and felt as if all his earthly hopes hung on his reply so he admitted that he could spell good continued miss tippet you are i suppose in rather poor circumstances is your father poor he's dead ma'am was drowned oh shocking that's very sad was your mother drowned too no ma'am she's alive and well at least she's well for her but she ain't over strong that's why i want to get work that i may help her and she wants me to be a clerk in an office but i'd rather be a fireman you couldn't make me a fireman could you ma'am at this point willie caught miss ward gazing intently at him over the top of her slate so he threw her into violent confusion by weaking at her no boy i can't make you a fireman strange wish why do you want to be one "'Cause it's such jolly fun,' replied Willie, with real enthusiasm. "'Regular banging, crashing sort of work, and God is fighting any day. "'And my brother Frank's a fireman, such a one, too. You've no notion. Six foot four he is, and strong as—' "'Oh, why, ma'am, he could take you up in one hand, ma'am, "'twirl you round his head like an old hat. "'He was at the fire at Beverly Square last night.' "'This speech was delivered with such vehemence, contained so many objectionable sentiments, and involved such a dreadful supposition in regard to the treatment of Miss Tippet's person, that the worthy lady was shocked beyond all expression. The concluding sentence, however, diverted her thoughts. Ah! Was he indeed at that sad fire? And did he help to put it out? Sure, and he did more than that, exclaimed Mattie, regarding the boy with sudden interest. If that was your brother that saved Miss Lou, he's a real man. Saved Lou, cried Miss Tippet. Was it your brother that saved Lou? Yes, ma'am, it was. 
bless him he's a noble fellow and i have a great pleasure in taking you by the hand for his sake miss tippet suited the action to the word and seized willie's hand which she squeezed warmly Matty Marion, with tears in her eyes, embraced him, and said that she only wished she had the chance of embracing his brother, too. Then they all said he must stay to lunch, as it was about lunchtime, and Miss Tippet added that he deserved to have been born in a higher position in life. At least his brother did, which was the same thing, for he was a true what's-his-name, who ought to be crowned with thingamajigs. Emma, who had latterly been looking at Willie, with deepening respect, immediately crowned him with laurels on the slate, and then Mattie rushed away for the lunch tray, rejoicing in the fire that had sent her back so soon to the old mistress whom she never wanted to leave, that had afforded scope for the display of such heroism, and had brought about altogether such an agreeable state of unwanted excitation. Just as the party were on the point of sitting down to luncheon, the street door knocker was applied to the door with an extremely firm touch. Miss Demas exclaimed Miss Tuppet. Oh, I'm so glad. Rush, Mattie. Mattie rushed, and immediately there was a sound on the wooden passage as of a gentleman with heavy boots. A moment later, and Mattie ushered in a very tall, broad shouldered, strapping lady, if we may venture to use that expression in reference to one of the fair sex miss demas was a sort of human eagle she had an eagle eye an aquiline nose an eagle flounce and an eagle heart going up to miss tippet she put a hand on each of her shoulders and stooping down pecked her so to speak on each cheek how are you my dear said miss demas not by any means tenderly but much in the tone in which one would expect to have one's money or one's life demanded "'Quite well, dear Julia, and so glad to see you. "'It's so good of you to take me by surprise this way. "'Just at lunch time, too. "'Another plate and knife, Mattie. "'This is a little boy, a friend, not exactly a friend, but a thing of me, you know.' "'No, I don't know, Emmelina. "'What is the precise thing of me you refer to this time?' "'said the uncompromising and matter-of-fact Miss Demas.' so particular dear julia replied miss tippet with a little sigh oh what's is in a uh, protege you know indeed said miss demas regarding willie with a severe frown as if in her estimation all proteges were necessarily villains yes dear julia and would you believe it that this boy's brother-in-law brother ma'am interrupted willie yes brother actually saved my darling's life last night at the the thing in beverly square what darling's life and what thing in beverly square demanded miss demas what have you not heard of the fire last night in beverly square my relative james arberly living there with his family all burnt to ashes and my sweet lou too uh what's his name was brought and a brave fireman went up it through fire and water and smoke young arberly went up before him and fell heat and suffocation and saved her in his arms and his name is frank and he is this little boy's brother-in-law to this brief summary given with much excitement miss demas listened with quiet composure and then said with grim sarcasm and very slowly let me see there was a fire in beverly square last night and james arberly living there with his family were all burned to ashes miss tippet here interrupted with no no but her stern friend, imposing silence with an eagle look, continued, "'All burned to ashes, and also your sweet Lou. A what's-his-name having been brought, a brave fireman goes up it, and apparently never comes down again, burned to ashes also, I fancy. But young Arberly, who went up before him, and fell, heat and suffocation being the result, saved someone's named her in his arms, his name being Frank, owing no doubt to his having been rebaptized for ever since I knew him, he has been named Frederick, and he is this boy's brother-in-law. By way of putting an extremely fine point on her sarcasm, Miss Demas turned to Willie, with a very condescending air, and said, "'Pray, when did your sister marry Mr. Frederick Auberly?' Willie, with a face of meekness, that can only be likened to that of a young turtle-dove, replied, "'Please, ma'am, it isn't my sister as has married Mr. Arberly, 
but it's my brother frank wilders as hopes to marry miss lou arberly on account of having saved her life when she comes of age ma'am miss demas stood aghast or rather sat aghast on receiving this reply and scanned willie's face with one of her most eagle glances but that small piece of impudence wore an expression of weak good nature and winked its eyes with the humility of a subdued pup while miss tippet looked half horrified and half amused Maddie grinned, and Emma squeaked through her nose. "'Boy,' said Miss Demas severely, "'your looks belie you.' "'Yes, ma'am,' answered Willie. "'My mother said I wasn't half so bad as I looked, "'and she's aware that I'm absent from home.' At this point Willie allowed a gleam of intelligence to shoot across his face, and he winked to Emma, who thereupon went into private convulsions in her handkerchief. Emmelina, said Miss Demas solemnly, let me warn you against that boy. He is a bad specimen of a bad sex. He is a precocious type of that base, domineering, proud, and perfidious creature that calls itself Lord of Creation, in which, in virtue of its superior physical power, takes up every position in life worth having, except that of wife and mother, meekly suggested Miss Tippet. "'Worth having,' repeated the eagle sternly, as if the position of wife and mother were not worth having. "'Worth having and leaves nothing for poor, weak-bodied, though not weak-minded, woman to do, except sew and teach brats. Bah! I hate men, and they hate me. I know it, and I would not have it otherwise. I wish they had never been made. I wish there had been none in the world but women. What a blessed world it would have been then!' Miss Demas hit the table with her hand, in a masculine manner, so forcibly that the plates and glasses rattled. Then she resumed, for she was now on a favorite theme, and was delivering a lecture to a select audience. "'But, mark you, I'm not going to put, put down by men. I mean to fight them with their own weapons. I mean to—' She paused suddenly at this point, and, descending from her platform, advised Miss Tippet to dismiss the boy at once. Poor Miss Tippet prepared to do so. She was completely under the power of Miss Demas, whom, strange to say, she loved dearly. She really believed that they agreed with each other on most points, although it was quite evident that they were utterly opposed to each other in everything, wherein the bond lay no philosopher could discover. Possibly it lay in the fact that they were absolute extremes, and, in verification of the proverb, had met. Be this as it may, a note was quickly written to her brother, Thomas Tippett, Esquire, which was delivered to Willie, with orders to take it the following evening to London Bridge, in the neighborhood of which Mr. Tippett dwelt and carried on his business. End of chapter 7 Recording by Zena Blue Chapter 8 of Fighting the Flames by R. M. Ballantyne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zena Blue. Fighting the Flames by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter 8. In the afternoon of the following day, Willie set off to the city in quest of Mr. Thomas Tippett. Having to pass the King Street fire station, he resolved to look in on his brother. The folding doors of the engine house were wide open, and the engine itself, clean and businesslike, with its brass work polished bright, stood ready for instant action. Two of the firemen were conversing at the open door, while several others could be seen lounging about inside. In one of the former, Willie recognized the strong man who had collared him on a well-remembered occasion. "'Please, sir,' said Willie, going up to him, "'is Frank Wilders inside?' "'Why, youngster,' said Dale, laying his hand on Willie's head, "'ain't you the boy that pulled our bell for a lark the other night?' "'Yes, sir, I am, but you let me off, you know, so I hope you won't bear me ill-will now.' "'That depends on how you behave in the future,' said Dale with a laugh. "'But well, what do you want with Mr. Frank Wilders?' "'I want to see him. He's my brother.' "'Oh, indeed. 
you'll find him inside willie entered the place with feelings of interest for his respect for firemen had increased greatly since he had witnessed their recent doings at the beverly square fire he found his brother writing at the little desk that stood in the window while five or six of his comrades were chatting by the fire and a group in a corner were playing draughts and spinning yarns of their old experiences all assisted in loading the air with tobacco smoke the round cloth caps worn by the men gave them such a more sailor-like and much less fireman-like appearance than helmets which with their respective hatchets hung on the walls rendering the apartment somewhat like a cavalry guard-room this change in the headpiece and the removal of the hatchet was the only alteration in their costume and what may be styled times of peace in other respects they were at all times accoutred in readiness to commence instant battle with the flames hello blazes how are ye said willie touching his brother on the shoulder at you willie said frank without looking up from his work where are we now come to tell ye there's a fire said willie with a serious look eh uh, what do you mean asked frank looking at his brother as if he half believed he was in earnest i mean what i say a fire here said willie solemnly striking his breast with a clenched fist here in hart street bosom square raging like a fury and all the engines of the fire brigade including the float couldn't put it out no nor even so much as squeench it then it's of no use our turning out i suppose said frank with a smile as he wiped his pen what set it alight lad a wax doll with flaxen hair and blue eyes answered willie them's the things is all long done for me when i was a boy i fought in love with a new wax doll every other day not that i ever owned one myself i only took a squint at em in toy shop winders and they always had flaxen hair and blue peepers now that i've become a man i've been a fought in love with a livin wax doll and she's got flaxen hair and blue eyes moreover she draws draws boy what does she draw corks inquires frank no replied willie with a look of supreme contempt nothing so low she draws faces and pictures like like a schoolmaster and added willie with a sigh she has been and drawed all the spirit out of this here bosom she must have left a good lot of combustible matter behind however if there's such a fire raging in it who may this pretty fire raiser be her name is emma ward and she belongs to a miss tippet to whom she's related somehow but i don't know where she got her nor who's her parents the same miss tippet is some sort of relation of mr Auberly who sent me to her with a note and she has sent me with another note to her brother near london bridge who i suppose will send me with another note to somebody else so i'm on my way down to see him i thought i'd look in to ask after you in passing and cheer you on to duty a violent fit of somewhat noisy coughing from one of the men at the fireplace attracted willie's attention at this point in the conversation what a noisy fellow you are corney remarked one of the men fay retorted corney it's noisy you'd be too av ye had the cold in your chist that i have sure and if ye'd been out five times in one night as i was on wednesday last wid the branch a howled in a smoke as you'd choke back some more hisself and it's a well-known he can stand the most anything not to spake of the hose bustin' right between my two feet. Come, come, Patty, said Dale, interrupting. Don't try to choke us now. You know very well that one of the fires was only a cutaway affair. Two were chimneys, and one was a false alarm. True for ye, cried Corney, who had a tendency to become irascible in argument, or while defending himself. True for ye, Mr. Dale but they was alarms for all that false or true was they not now anyhow they alarmed me out of me bed five times in a night as cold as the polar regions and last time was a rare case of flats burnt out and four hours work in iced weather 
There was a general laugh at this point, followed by several coughs and sneezes, for the men were all more or less afflicted with colds, owing to the severity of the weather and frequency of the fires that had occurred at that time. "'There's some of us can sing chorus to Corny,' observed one of the group. "'I never saw such weather, and it seems to me that the worse the weather, the more the fires, as if they got em up on purpose to kill us.' bill moxie cried another you're always giving out some truism with a face like solomon well jack williams retorted moxie it's more than i can say of you for you never say anything worth listening to and you couldn't look like solomon if you was ever to try ever so much you're too stupid for that i say lads cried frank wilders what do you say to send along to the doctor for another bottle of cough mixture same as the first this proposal was received with a general laugh he'll not send us more o' that tipple you may depend said williams no not have we most dying said corney with a grin what was it asked williams didn't you hear about it inquired moxie oh to be sure not you were in hospital after you got run over by the baker street engine tell him about it corney it was you that asked the doctor wasn't it for another bottle corney was about to speak when a young fireman entered the room with his helmet hanging on his arm is it go on he inquired looking round no it's go back young rags replied baxmore as he refilled his pipe it was only a chimney so you're not wanted can any of you fillers lend me a bit of tobacco asked rags i forgot to fetch mine here you are said dale offering him a piece of twist hain't you got a hard backy for the tooth said rags will that do asked frank wilders cutting off a piece from a plug of cavendish thank ye good afternoon young rags put the quid in his cheek and went away humming a tune in explanation of the above incident it is necessary to tell the reader that when a fire occurred in any part of london at the time of which we write the fire station nearest to it at once sent out its engines and men and telegraphed to the then head or centre station at watling street london was divided into four districts each district containing several fire stations and being presided over by a foreman from Watling Street, the news was telegraphed to the foreman's stations, whence it was transmitted to the stations of their respective districts, so that in a few minutes after the breaking out of a fire, the fact was known to firemen all over London. As we have said, the stations nearest to the scene of conflagration turned out engines and men, but the other stations furnished a man each. Thus, machinery was set in motion which moved, as it were, the whole metropolis, and while the engines were going to the fire at full speed single men were setting out from every point of the compass to walk to it with their sailors caps on their heads and their helmets on their arms and this took place in the case of every alarm of fire because fire is an element that will not brook delay and it does not do to wait to ascertain whether it is worth while to turn out such a force of men for it or not in order however to prevent this unnecessary assembling of men when the fire was found to be trifling or when as was sometimes the case it was a false alarm the fireman in charge of the engine that arrived first at once sent a man back to the station with a stop that is with an order to telegraph to the central station that the fire turns out to be only a chimney or a false alarm and that all hands who have started from the distant stations may be stopped the stop was at once telegraphed to the foreman from whom it was passed just as the call had been to the outlying stations and the second telegram might arrive within a quarter of an hour of the first of course the man from each station had set out before that time and the stop was too late for him but it was his duty to call at the various fire stations he happened to pass on the way where he soon found out whether he was to go on or go back if no telegram had been received he went on to the fire sometimes walking four or five miles to it at not less than four miles an hour on coming up to the scene of conflagration he put on his helmet thrust his cap into the breast of his coat and reported himself to the chief of the fire brigade who was usually on the spot or to the foreman in command 
and found probably that he had arrived just in time to be of great service in the way of relieving the men who first attacked the flames if on the other hand he found that the stop had been telegraphed he turned back before having gone much more than a mile from his own station and so went quietly home to bed in the days of which we write the effective and beautiful system of telegraphy which now exists had not been applied to the fire stations of london and the system of stops and calls although in operation was carried out much less promptly and effectively by means of messengers some time before the entrance of willie wilders into the king street station the engine had been turned out to a fire close at hand which proved to be only a chimney on fire which was put out by means of a hand pump and a bucket of water while moxie was sent back with the stop to the station the affair was over and almost forgotten and the men had resumed their pipes as we have seen when young rags entered and was told to go back apologizing for this necessary digression we return to joe corney the fact was he said that we had a fearful time of it that winter blown great guns and snow nearly every night and what with heat at the fires and cold in the streets and hot water pouring on us at one minute and freezing on us the next almost every man jack of us was coughing and sneezing and watherin so bad at our eyes and noses that i do believe if we'd held them over the suction pipes we might have filled the engines without troubling the mains at all so the doctor he said says he lads i'll send ye a bottle of stuff as'll put ye right and sure enough down comes the bottle that night when we was smoking our pipes just after our roll call it turned out to be the best medicine ever was musha says i here's the top of the morning to ye boys baxmore he smacks his lips when he tastes it opens his eyes tosses off the glass and holds it out for another how down fair play cried jack williams so we all had a glass round it was just like lemonade or ginger beer it was so we sat down and smoked our pipes over it and spun yarns and sung songs in fact we made a jollification of it and when we got up to turn in there weren't a drop left in the bottle you better go to the doctor for another bottle says moxie as he went out i will says i i'll go in the morning sure enough away i goes to the morning to dr offley doctor says i holding out the bottle we all think our colds are much the better o this here medicine, and I've come to have ye please for another o the same. Musha, but ye should have seen the rage he goes off into. Finished it all, says he. Every drop, doctor, says I, and one sitting. At that he stomped and swore at me, and ordered me away as if I'd been a poor relation. And, says he, I'll send ye a bottle to-night that'll cure ye so sure he did the second bottle would have poisoned the rat it lasted us all six months and i do believe you'll find most of it in the cupboard at this minute av ye look come willie said frank while the men were laughing at the remembrance of this incident i'm going down your way and we'll give you a convoy we can take a look in at the gymnastics as we pass if you choose all right blazes come along so saying they left the station and set off at a brisk pace in the direction of the city end of chapter eight recording by cena blue chapter nine of fighting the flames by r m ballantyne this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zena Blue. Fighting the Flames by R. M. Valentine. Chapter Nine. As the brothers drew near to the busy region of the city, which lies to the north of London Bridge, Frank turned aside into one of the narrow streets that diverge from the main thoroughfare. "Where are you going?" inquired Willie there was a fire here last night said frank i went to have a look at the damage a fire exclaimed willie 
why blazes it strikes me there's been more fires than usual last night in london only two lad only two how many would you have asked willie with a laugh don't you know said frank that we have about four fires every night sometimes more sometimes fewer of course we don't all of us turn out to them but some of the brigade turn out to that number on an average every night of the year are you joking frank indeed i am not i wish with all my heart i could say that i was joking it's a fact boy you know i have not been long in the forest yet i've gone to as many as six fires in one night and we often go to two or three the one we are going to see the remains of just now was too far from us for our engine to turn out but we got the call to send a man on and i was sent when i arrived and reported myself to mr braidwood the two top floors were burnt out and the fire was nearly got under there were three engines and the men were up on the window sills of the second floor with the branches playing on the last of the flames while the men of the salvage corps were getting the furniture out of the first floor conductor brown was there with his escape and had saved the whole family from the top floor just before i arrived he had been changed from his old station at the west end that very day he is a wonderful fellow that conductor many a life he has saved but indeed the same may be said of most of the men in the force especially the old hands here we are lad this is the house frank stopped as he spoke in front of a ruined tenement or rather in front of the gap which was now strewn with the charred and blackened debris of what has once been a house the street in which it stood was a narrow mean one inhabited by a poor and to judge from appearance a dissipated class the remains of the house were guarded by policemen while a gang of men were engaged in digging among the ruins which still smoked a little here and there what are they digging for asked willie i fear they are looking for dead bodies the house was let to lodgers and swarmed with people at first it was thought they were all were saved but just before i was ordered home after the fire was got under some one said that an old man and his grandchild were missing i suppose they're looking for them now on inquiring of a policeman however frank learned that the remains of the old man and his grandchild had already been found and that they were searching for the bodies of others who were missing a little beyond the spot where the fire had occurred a crowd was gathered round a man who stood on a chair haranguing them with apparently considerable effect for ever and anon his observations were received with cries of hear hear and laughter going along the middle of the narrow street in order to avoid the smell of the old clothes shops and pawnbrokers as well as the risk of contact with their wares frank and willie elbowed their way through the crowd to within a few yards of the speaker what is he inquired frank of a rather dissipated elderly woman he is a clown or a hacker bat or something of that sort in one of the theatres or music halls he has been burnt out of his own last night and is selling off all he has been able to save by auction come now ladies and gents cried the clown taking up a rather seedy-looking greatcoat which he held aloft with one hand and pointed to it with the other who's a going to bid for this ere garment a hextra superfine double-drilled kirschemere greatcoat fresh from the looms of tuscany at least it was fresh of em ten years ago that was when my grandfather was made lord mayor of london and it's been renewing its youth the coat not the lord mayor ever since it's more glossy i do assure you ladies and gents than when it first come from the looms by reason of the pile having worn off and you'll observe the glossiness is most beautiful and brightest about the elbows and the seams of the back who bids for this ere venerable garment six bob come now don't all bid at once who said six bob no reply being made to this except a laugh the clown who by the way wore a similarly glossy greatcoat with a hat to match protested that his ears must have deceived him or his imagination had been whispering hopeful things which was not unlikely for his imagination was a very powerful one when he noticed frank's tall figure among the crowd 
come now fireman this is the wery article you wants you comed out to buy it i know and here it is by strange coincidence ready made to hand what do you bid six bob or say five i know you've got the wife and a large family of young firemen to keep so i'll let it go cheap perhaps it's too small for you but that's easy put right you've only got to slit it up behind the neck which is an infallible cure for a tight fit and you can let down the cuffs which is double and if it's short you can cut off the collar and sew it to unto the skirts it's waterproof too and fireproof patent asbestos when it's sturdy you've got nothing to do but walk into the fire and it'll come out new when it's thoroughly wet on the outside turn it inside out and there you are to all appearance as dry as bone what you won't have it at the no price well now i'll tempt you i'll make it two bob say one cried a baker who had been listening to this with a broad grin on his flowery countenance ladies and gents cried the clown drying himself up with dignity there's an individual in this crowd i beg pardon this assemblage has asked me to say one i do say one and i say it with melancholy feelings as to the liberality of my species one bob a feller man has a been burnt out of his home and needs ready money to keep him from starvation offers his best greatcoat a hextra superfine double drilled or milled i forget which kershamir from the looms of tuscany for one bob one and six muttered an old clothes man with a black cotton sack on his shoulder one and six echoed the clown with animation one and six bid one and six who said one and seven was the gent with the red nose no one and six going at the ridiculously low figure one and six gone as the old ooman who went her cat died of apoplexy i've never knocked nothing down not even a skittle since i joined the peace society now ladies and gents the next thing i've got to offer is an armchair hand up the armchair jim a very antique piece of furniture was handed up by a little boy whom willie recognized as the little boy who had once conversed with him in front of the chocolate shop in holborn hill thank you my son said the clown taking the chair with one hand and patting the boy's head with the other this ladies and gents he added in a parenthetical tone is my son he's been burnt out to house and home too now then who bids for the old armchair the weary identical armchair that the song was written about in the embrace of this here chair has sat for generations past the family of the ocatelis that's my name ladies and gents at your service here sat my great-great-grandfather who was used to say that his great-grandfather sat in it too here sat his son and his son's son the lord mayor's it was and his son my father ladies and gents who died in it besides and whose son now offers it to the highest bidder you'll observe its antiquity ladies and gents that it's beauty it's what i may call in the language of the aristocracy a article of virtue which means that it's a article as is surrounded by virtuous memories in connection with the defunct now then say five bob for the whole darn chair while the clown was endeavouring to get the chair disposed of willie pushed his way to the side of jim catley i say youngster would you like a cup of chocolate began willie of recalling to the boy their farmer meeting jim whose face wore a sad and dispirited look turned angrily and said come i don't want none of your sauce it ain't sauce i'm talking of it's chocolate retorted willie but come jim i don't want to bother ye i'm sorry to see you and your dad such a fix have you lost much it's not what we've lost that troubles us said jim softened by willie's sympathetic tone more than his words but sister ziza is took bad and she's a fairy at drury lane and taking her down the fire escape as well nigh killed her we've got such a gold damp cellar of a place to put her in that i don't think she'll get better at all anyhow she'll lose her engagement for she can't make two speeches and go up in a silver cloud among the blue fire with the fluenza and her air all but singed off her ed jim almost whimpered at this point and willie quitting his side abruptly went back to frank who was still standing an amused auditor of the clown and demanded a shilling what for lad never you mind blazes but give me the bob and i'll pay you back before the week's out 
Frank gave him a shilling, with which he at once turned to Jim, and thrusting it into his hand, said, "'There, Jim, your dad's hard up just now. Go you and get physic with that for the fairy. Influenza's is ticklish things to play with. Where do you stop?' "'Well, you are a queer, and thank ye all the same,' said Jim, pocketing the shilling. "'We got a sort of cellar just two doors east of the burnt house. Why?' "'Cause I'll come and see you, Jim. I'd like to see a live fairy in plain clothes, with her wings off. The rest of the sentence was cut short by the clown, who, having disposed of the old armchair to a chimney sweep, ordered Jim to end up another article. At the same moment, Frank touched Willie on the shoulder and said, Let's go, lad. I'll be late, I fear, for the gymnastics. At the period of which we write, the then chief of the London Fire Brigade, Mr. Braidwood, had introduced a system of gymnastic training among the firemen, which he had found from experience to be a most useful exercise to fit the men for the arduous work they had to perform. Before going to London to take command of and reorganize the brigade, which then went by the name of the London Fire Engine Establishment, it was in a very unsatisfactory condition. Mr. Braidwood had, for a long period, been chief of the Edinburgh Fire Brigade, which he had brought to a state of great efficiency. Taking the requirements and conditions of the service in Edinburgh into consideration, he had come to the conclusion that the best men for the work in that city were masons, house carpenters, slaters, and such like. But these men, when at their ordinary employments, being accustomed to bring only certain muscles into full play, were found to have a degree of stiffness in their general movements which prevented them from performing their duty as firemen with that ease and celerity which are so desirable. To obviate this evil, he instituted the gymnastic exercises, which, by bringing all the muscles of the body into action, and by increasing the development of the frame generally, rendered the men lithe and supple, and in every way more fitted for the performance of duties in which their lives frequently depended on their promptitude and vigor. In addition to these advantages, it was found that those exercises gave the men confidence when placed in certain situations of danger. For example, writes Mr. Braidwood, a fireman, untrained in gymnastics, on the third or fourth floor of a burning house, with a branch in his hands, who was uncertain as to his means of escape, in the event of his return by the stair being cut off, will be too much concerned about his own safety to render much service, and will certainly not be half so efficient as the experienced gymnast who, with a hatchet and eighty feet of rope at his waist and a window near him, feels himself in comparative security, knowing that he has the means and the power of lowering himself easily and safely into the street a knowledge which not only gives him confidence, but enables him to give his undistracted attention to the exigencies of the fire. It was to attend this gymnastic class that Frank now turned aside, and proposed to bid Willie good-bye, but Willie begged to be taken into the room. Frank complied, and the boy soon found himself in an apartment fitted up with all the appliance of a gymnasium where a number of powerful young men were leaping, vaulting, climbing, and in other ways improving their physical powers. Frank joined them, and for a long time Willie stood in rapt and envious contemplation of the busy scene. At first he could not avoid feeling that there seemed a good deal more of play than business in their doings, but his admiration of the scene deepened when he remembered the bold acts of the firemen at Beverly Square, and recognized some of the faces of the men who had been on duty there, and reflected that these very men, who seemed thus to be playing themselves, would on that very night, in all probability, be called upon to exert these powers sternly and seriously, yet coolly, in the midst of scenes of terror and confusion, and in the face of imminent personal danger. Brooding over these things, Willie, having at length torn himself away, hastened on his pilgrimage to London Bridge. End of chapter 9 Read by Zena Blue Chapter 10 of Fighting the Flames This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zena Blue. Fighting the Flames by R. M. Valentine. Chapter Ten. Difficulties and Dissipations. In a very small office, situate in a very large warehouse, in that great storehouse of the world's wealth, Tooley Street, sat a clerk named Edward Hooper. Among his familiar friends, Edward was better known by the name of Ned. He was seated on top of a tall three-legged stool, which, to judge from the uneasy and restless motions of its occupant, must have been a peculiarly uncomfortable seat indeed. There was a clock on the wall just opposite to Ned's desk, which that young gentleman was in the habit of consulting frequently, very frequently and comparing with his watch as if he doubted its veracity this was very unreasonable for he always found that the two timepieces told the truth at least that they agreed with each other nevertheless in his own private heart ned hooper thought that clock and sometimes called it the slowest piece of ancient furniture he had ever seen during one of Ned's comparisons of the two timepieces, the door opened, and Mr. Auberly entered, with a dark cloud, figuratively speaking, on his brow. At the same moment, the door of an inner office opened, and Mr. Auberly's head clerk, who had seen his employer's approach through the dusty window, issued forth and bowed respectfully, with a touch of condolence in his air, as he referred with much regret to the fire at Beverly Square and hoped that miss arberly was not much the worse of her late alarm well she is not the better for it said mr arberly but i hope she will be quite well soon indeed the doctor assures me of this if care is taken of her i wish that was the only thing on my mind just now but i am perplexed about another matter mr quill are you alone quite alone sir said quill throwing open the door of the inner office i want to consult with you about frederick said mr auberly as he entered the door shut out the remainder of the consultation at this point so edward hooper consulted the clock again and sighed if size could have delivered hooper from his sorrows there is no doubt that the accumulated millions of which he was delivered in that office during the last five years would have filled him with a species of semi-celestial bliss at last the hands of the clock reached the hour the hour that was wont to evoke ned's last sigh and set him free but it was an aggravating clock nothing would persuade it to hurry it would not for all the untold wealth contained in the great stores of tooley street have abated the very last second of the last minute of the hour on the contrary it went through that second quite as slowly as all the others ned fancied it went much slower at that one on purpose and then with a sneaking parade of its intention to begin to strike it gave a prolonged hiss and did its duty and nothing but its duty by striking the hour at a pace so slow that it recalled forcibly to ned hooper's imaginative mind the minute gun at sea there was a preliminary warning given by that clock some time before the premonitory hiss between this harbinger of coming events and the joyful sound which was felt to be an age ned was wont to wipe his pen and arrange his papers when the hiss began he invariably closed his warehouse book and laid it on the desk and had the desk locked before the first stroke of the hour while the minute gun at sea was going on he changed his office coat for a surtout, out not perfectly new and a white hat with a black band the rim of which was not perfectly straight so exact and methodical was ned in these operations that his hand usually fell on the door latch as the last gun was fired by the aggravating clock on occasions of unusual celerity he even managed to drown the last shot in the bang of the door and went off with a sensation of triumph on the present occasion however ned hooper deemed it politic to be so busy that he could not attend to the warnings of the timepiece he even sat on his stool a full quarter of an hour beyond the time of departure at length mr arberly issued forth 
"'Mr. Quill,' said he, "'my mind is made up, so it's useless to urge such considerations on me. Good night.' Mr. Quill, whose countenance was sad, looked as though he would willingly have urged the considerations referred to over again, and backed them up with a few more. But Mr. Arverley's tone was peremptory, so he only opened the door and bowed the great man out. "'You can go, Hooper,' said Mr. Quill, retiring slowly to the inner office. "'I will lock up. Send the porter here.' This was a quite unnecessary permission. Quill, being a good-natured, easy-going man, never found fault with Ned Hooper, and Ned, being a presumptuous young fellow, though good-humoured enough, never waited for Mr. Quill's permission to go. He was already in the act of putting on the white hat, and two seconds afterwards he was in the street wending his way homeward. There was a tavern named the Angel at the corner of one of the streets off Tully Street, which Edward Hooper had to pass every evening on his way home. Ned, we grieve to say, was fond of his beer. He always found it difficult to pass a tavern. Yet, curiously enough, he never found any difficulty in passing this tavern, probably because he always went in and slaked his first before passing it. "'Good evening, Mr. Hooper,' said the landlord, who was busy behind his counter, serving a motley and disreputable crew. Hooper nodded in reply, and said good evening to Mrs. Butler, who attended to the customers at another part of the counter. "'Good evening, sir. What do you have tonight, sir?' "'Part of the same, Mrs. B.' replied Ned. This was the invariable question and reply, for Ned was a man of regularity and method in everything that affected his personal comforts. Had he brought one-tenth of his regularity and method to bear on his business conduct, he would have been a better and happier man. The foaming pot was handed, and Ned conversed with Mrs. Butler while he enjoyed it, and commenced his evening, which usually ended in semi-intoxication. Meanwhile, Edward Hooper's chum and fellow lodger sat in their mutual chamber awaiting him. John Barrett did not drink, but he smoked and while waiting for his companion he solaced himself with a pipe. He was a fine manly fellow, very different from Ned, who, although strong of limb and manly enough, was slovenly in gait and dress, and bore unmistakable marks of dissipation about him. "'Very odd. He's later than usual,' muttered Barrett, as he glanced out at the window, and then at the tea-table, which, with the tea-service and indeed everything in the room, proved that the young men were by no means wealthy. "'He'll be taking an extra pot at the angel,' muttered John Barrett, proceeding to relight his pipe while he shook his head gravely. "'But he'll be here soon.' A foot on the stair caused Barrett to believe that he was a true prophet, but the rapidity and firmness of the step quickly disabused him of that idea. The door was flung open with a crash, and a hearty youth with glowing eyes strode in. "'Fred Arberley!' exclaimed Barrett in surprise. "'Won't you welcome me?' demanded Fred. "'Welcome you? Of course I will. Most heartily, old boy,' cried Barrett, seizing his friend's hand and wringing it. "'But if you burst in on a fellow unexpectedly in this fashion, and with such wild looks, why—' "'Well, well, don't explain, man. I hate explanations. I have come here for sympathy,' said Fred Arberley, shutting the door and sitting down by the fire. "'Sympathy, Fred. Aye, sympathy. When a man is in distress, he naturally craves for sympathy, and he turns, also naturally, to those who can and will give it. Not to everybody, John Barrett, only to those who can feel with him as well as for him. I am in distress, John, and ever since you and I fought our first and last battle at Eton, I have found you a true sympathizer.' So now, is your heart ready to receive the flood of my sorrows? Young Arberley said the latter part of this in a half-jesting tone, but he was evidently in earnest, so his friend replied by squeezing his hand warmly and saying, Let's hear about it, Fred, while he relighted his pipe. You have but a poor lodging here, John, said Arberley, looking round the room. Barrett turned on his friend a quick look of surprise, and then said, with a smile, 
well i admit that it is not quite equal to a certain mansion in beverly square that i wot of but it's good enough for a poor clerk in an insurance office you are right continued arberley it is not equal to that mansion whose upper floors are at this moment a cheval free of charcoal beams and raptors depicted on a dark sky and whose lower floors are a fantastic compound of burned bricks and lime broken boards and blackened furniture you don't mean to say there's been a fire exclaimed barrett and you don't mean to tell me do you that a clerk in a fire insurance office does not know it i have been ill for two days returned barrett and have not seen the papers but i'm very sorry to hear of it indeed i am the house is insured of course i believe it is replied fred carelessly but that is not what troubles me no exclaimed his friend no replied the other if the house had not been insured my father has wealth enough in those abominably unpicturesque stores in tooley street to rebuild the whole of beverly square if it were burnt down the fire costs me not a thought although by the way it nearly cost me my life in a vain attempt i made to rescue my poor dear sister lou vain attempt exclaimed barrett with a look of concern i vain as far as i was concerned but a noble fireman a fellow that would make a splendid model for hercules in the life academy sprang to the rescue after me and saved her god bless him dear lou has got a severe shake but the doctors say that we have only to take good care of her and she will do well but to return to my woes listen john and you shall hear fred arberley paused as though meditating how he should commence you know said he that i am my father's only son and lou is his only daughter yes well my father has disinherited me and left the whole of his fortune to lou as far as dear lou is concerned i am glad for myself i am sad for it is awkward to say the least of it to have been brought up with unlimited command of pocket money and expectations of considerable wealth and suddenly to find myself all but penniless without a profession and without expectations at the age of twenty-two he paused and looked at his friend who sat in mute amazement failing lou continued fred calmly my father's fortune goes to some distant relative but why wherefore exclaimed barrett you shall hear continued arberley you are aware that ever since i was able to burn the end of a stick and draw faces on the nursery door i have had a wild insatiable passion for drawing and ever since the memorable day on which i was whipped by my father and kissed tearfully by my beloved mother for caricaturing our cook on the dining-room window with a diamond ring i have had an earnest unextinguishable desire to become a a painter an artist a dauber a dirtier of canvas do you understand perfectly said barrett well my father has long been resolved it seems to make me a man of business for which i have no turn whatever you are aware that for many years i have dutifully slaved and toiled at these heavy books in our office which have proved so heavy that they have nearly squeezed the soul out of me and instead of coming to like them better as i was led to believe i should i have only come to hate them more during all this time too i have been studying painting late and early and although i have not gone through the regular academical course i have studied much in the best of all schools that of nature i have urged upon my father repeatedly and respectfully that it is possible for me to uphold the credit of the family as a painter that as the business can be carried on by subordinates there is no necessity for me to be at the head of it and that as he has made an ample fortune already the half of which he had told me was to be mine i would be quite satisfied with my share and did not want any more but my father would never listen to my arguments the last time we got on the subject he called me a mean-spirited fellow and said he was sorry i had ever been born whereupon i expressed regret that he had not been blessed with a more congenial and satisfactory son and tried to point out that it was impossible to change my nature 
then i urged all the old arguments over again and wound up by saying that even if i were to become possessor of the whole of his business to-morrow i would sell it off take to painting as a profession and become the patron of aspiring young painters from that date forward to my surprise and consternation this last remark put him in such a towering rage that he vowed he would disinherit me if i did not then and there throw my palette and brushes into the fire of course i declined to do such an act whereupon he dismissed me from his presence for ever this occurred on the morning of the day of the fire i thought he might perhaps relent after such an evidence of the mutability of human affairs i even ventured to remind him that tully street was not made of asbestos and that an occasional fire occurred there but this made him worse than ever so i went the length of saying that i would at all events in deference to his wishes continue to go to the office at least for some time to come but alas i had roused him to such a pitch that he refused to hear of it unless i should throw my palette and brushes into the fire flesh and blood you know could not do that so i left him and walked off twenty miles into the country to relieve my feelings there i fell in with such a splendid bit a sluice with the stump of a tree and a winding bit of water with overhanging willows and a peep of country beyond i sat down and sketched and forgot my woes and rejoiced in the fresh air and delightful sounds of birds and cows and sheep and hated to think of tooley street then i slept in a country inn walked back to london next day and voila here i am don't you think fred that time will soften your father no i don't think it on the contrary i know it won't he is a good man but he has an iron will which i never saw subdued then my dear fred i advise you to consider the propriety of throwing your palette and brushes into my dear john i did not come here for your advice i came for your sympathy and you have it fred cried barrett earnestly but have you really such an unconquerable love for painting have i really echoed fred do you think i would have come to such a pass as this for a trifle why man you have no idea how my soul longs for the life of a painter for the free fresh air of the country for the poetry of the woods the water and the sky for the music of bird and beast and running brook you know the true proverb man made the town but god made the country what asked barrett would become of the town if all men thought as you do oh john barrett has town life so marred your once fine intellect that you put such a question in earnest suppose i answer it by another what would become of the country if all men thought and acted as you do barrett smiled and smoked and what continued arberly would become of the fine arts if all men delighted in dirt dust dullness and desks depend on it john that our tastes and tendencies are not the result of accident they were given to us for a purpose i hold it as an axiom that when a man or a boy has a strong and decided bias or partiality for any particular work that he knows something about he has really a certain amount of capacity for that work beyond the average of men and is led thereto by a higher power than that of man do not misunderstand me i do not say that when a boy expresses a longing desire to enter the navy or the army he has necessarily an aptitude for these professions far from it he has only a romantic notion of something about which experimentally he knows nothing but when man or boy has put his hand to any style of work and thereafter loves it and longs after it i hold that that is the work for which he was destined and for which he is best suited perhaps you are right said barrett smoking harder than ever at all events i heartily sympathize with you and at this point in the conversation was interrupted by a loud burst of whistling as the street door opened and the strains of rural britannia filled the entire building the music was interrupted by the sudden opening of another door and a rough growl from a male voice don't get waxy old feller said the performer in a youthful voice i ain't a-goin to charge you no think for it i always do my music gratis having a bee turn o mind 
the door was slammed violently and royal britannia immediately burst forth with renewed and pointed emphasis presently it ceased and a knock came to barrett's door well what do you want you noisy scamp said barrett flinging the door open and revealing the small figure of willie wilders please sir said willie consulting the back of a note are you mr T tom tupper esq no i'm not ain't there sich a name in the house ah uh, no not that i know of willie's face looked blank well i was told he lived here he muttered again consulting the note here let me look said barrett taking the note from the boy this is tippet not tupper he lives in the top floor by the way auberly said barrett glancing over his shoulder isn't tom tippet a sort of connection of yours yes a distant one said fred carelessly too distant to make it worth while our becoming acquainted he's rich and eccentric i'm told assuredly he must be the latter if he lives in such a hole as this what are you staring at boy this question was put to willie please sir are you the mr arberly who was a most scumfished with smoke at the beverly square fire to other day i'm trying to get hold of your sister fred could not but smile as he admitted the fact please sir i hope your sister ain't the wuss of it sir not much i hope thank you for inquiring but how come you know about the fire and to be interested in my sister cause i was there sir and it was my brother frank wilders as saved your sister was it indeed exclaimed fred becoming suddenly interested come let me hear more about your brother willie nothing loth related every fact he was acquainted with in regard to frank's career and his own family history in the course of which he refilled the object of his visit to mr tippet when he had finished frederick arberly shook hands with him and said now willie go and deliver your note if the application is successful well but if it fails or you don't like your work just call upon me and i'll see what can be done for you yes sir thank ye said willie where did you say i was to call sir call at uh, uh yes my boy call here and let my friend mr barrett know you want to see me he will let me know and you shall hear from me just at present well never mind go and deliver your note now your brother is a noble fellow good night and you're a fine little fellow yourself he added after willie closed the door the fine little fellow gave vent to such a gush of rural britannia at the moment that the two friends turned with a smile to each other just then a man's voice was heard at the foot of the stair grumbling angrily at the same moment young arberly rose to leave good night barrett i'll write to you as soon as my whereabout and what about perhaps see you ere long good night god prosper you fred good night as he spoke the grumbler came stumbling along the passage good night again fred said barrett almost pushing his friend out i have a particular reason for not wishing you to see the for the man who is coming all right old fellow said fred as he passed out and drew up against the wall to allow a drunken man to stumble heavily into the room next moment he was in the street hastening he knew not whither but following the old and well-known route to beverly square end of chapter 10 recording by zena blue chapter number 11 of fighting the flames this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Zena Blue Fighting the Flames by R. M. Ballantyne Chapter 11 When Willie Wilders knocked at Tom Tippett's door at the top of the house, a rich, jovial bass voice cried, Come in! So Willie went in and stood before a stout old gentleman, whose voluminous whiskers, meeting below his chin, made ample amends for the total absence of hair from the top of his head mr tippet stood without coat or vest and with his braces tied around his waist 
at a carpenter's bench holding a saw in his right hand and a piece of wood in his left well my lad what's your business he inquired in the voice of a stentor and with a beaming smile of an elderly cherub please sir a note from a lady i wish your message had been verbal boy it's so difficult to read ladies hands they're so abominably angular and where are my specs i have a mind to have em screw nailed to my nose ah here they are he found them under a jack plane and a mass of shavings put them on and read the note while willie took the opportunity of observing that mr tippet's room was a drawing-room parlor dining-room workshop and old curiosity shop all in one a half-open door revealed the fact that an inner chamber contained mr tippet's bed and an indescribable mass of machinery and models in every stage of progression and covered with dust more or less thick in exact proportion to their respective ages a dog and cat lay side by side on the hearth asleep and a small fire burned in a grate on the sides of which stood a variety of crucibles and such like articles and a glue pot also a teapot and kettle you want a situation in my office as a clerk inquired mr tippet tearing up his sister's letter and throwing it into the fire if you please sir said willie ha huh, are you good at writing and ciphering middlin sir <laughs> Do you know where my office is and what it is no sir what would you say now asked mr tippet seating himself on his bench or rather on the top of a number of gimblets and chisels and files and pincers that lay on it what would you say now to sitting from morning till night in a dusty ware room where the light is so feeble that it can scarcely penetrate the dirt that encrusts the windows writing in books that are so greasy that the ink can hardly be got to mark the paper how would you like that william wilders eh i don't know sir replied willie with a somewhat depressed look of course you don't yet that is the sort of place you'd have to work in boy if i engaged you for that is a correct description of my warehouse i'm a sleeping partner in the firm do you know what that is boy mm, no sir well it's a partner that does no work but i'm wide awake for all that and have a pretty good notion of what is going on there now lad if i were to take you in what would you say to five pounds a year it don't sound much sir said willie bluntly but if you take me in with the understanding that i'm to work my way upwards i don't mind about the pay at first good said mr tippet with a nod of approval what do you think of my workshop he added looking round with a cherubic smile it's a funny place responded willie with a grin a funny place eh well i dare say it is lad in your eyes but let me tell you it is a place of deep interest and i may add without vanity importance there are inventions here all in a state bordering more or less upon completion which will when brought into operation modify the state of society very materially in many of its most prominent phases here for instance is a self-acting galvano hydraulic engine which will entirely supersede the use of steam and by preventing the consumption of coal now going on will avert or at least postpone the decline of the british empire able men have calculated that in the course of a couple of hundred years or so our coal beds will be exhausted i have gone over their calculations and detected several flaws in them which when corrected show a very different result namely that in seventeen or eighteen years from this time there will not be an ounce of coal in the kingdom mr tippet paused to observe the effect of this statement Willie, having never heard of such things before, and having a thoughtful and speculative as well as waggish turn of mind, listened with open eyes and mouth and earnest attention. So Mr. Tippet went on. The frightful consequences of such a state of things you may conceive, or rather they are utterly inconceivable. 
owing to the foundations of the earth having been cut away it is more than probable that the present coal districts of the united kingdom will collapse the ocean will rush in and several of our largest counties will become salt-water lakes besides this coal being the grand source of our national wealth its sudden failure will entail national bankruptcy the barbarians of europe taking advantage of our condition will pour down upon us and the last spark of true civilization in our miserable world will be extinguished the last refuge for the hunted foot of persecuted freedom will be finally swept from the face of the earth here mr tippet brought the saw down on the bench with such violence that the dog and cat started incontinently to their legs and willie himself was somewhat shaken now continued mr tippet utterly regardless of the sensation he had created and wiping the perspiration from his shining head with a handful of shavings now william wilders all this may be shall be prevented by the adoption of the galvano hydraulic engine and the consequent restriction of the application of coal to the legitimate purposes of warming our dwellings and cooking our victuals i mean to bring this matter before the home secretary whenever i have completed my invention which however is not quite perfected then again continued mr tippet becoming more and more enthusiastic as he observed the deep impression his explanations were making on willie who stood glaring at him in speechless amazement here you have my improved sausage machine for converting all animal substances into excellent sausages i hold that every animal substance is more or less good for food and that it is a sad waste to throw away bones and hair etc etc merely because these substances are unpalatable or difficult to chew now my machine gets over this difficulty you cut an animal up just as it is killed and put it into the machine hair skin bones blood and all and set it in motion by turning on the galvano hydraulic fluid delicious sausages are the result in about twenty minutes see my dog there chips i call him because he dwells in the midst of chips and shavings he sleeps upon chips and if he does not exactly eat chips he lives upon scraps which have a strong resemblance to them the cat has no name i am partial to the time-honored name of puss besides a cat is not worthy of a name physically speaking it is only a bundle of living fur a mere mass of soft animated nature as goldsmith would express it intellectually it is nothing a sort of existent nonentity a moral void on which a name would be utterly thrown away well i could take these two animals chips and puss put them in here alive too for there is a killing apparatus in the instrument which will effectually do away with the cruel process of slaughtering and with its accompanying nuisances of slaughterhouses and butchers put them in here i say and in twenty minutes they would be ground up into sausages i know that enemies to progress ignorant persons in the like will scoff at this and say it is similar to the american machine into one end of which you put a tree and it comes out at the other end in the shape of ready-made furniture but such scoffs will cease while my invention will live i am not bigoted william there may be good objections to my inventions and great difficulties connected with them but the objections i will answer and the difficulties i will overcome this instrument continued mr tippet pointing to a huge beam which leant against the end of a small apartment is only a speculative effort of mine it is meant to raise enormous weights such as houses i have long felt it to be most desirable that people should be able to raise their houses from their foundations by the strength of a few men and convey them to other localities either temporarily or permanently i have not succeeded yet but i see my way to success and after all the idea is not new you can see it partially carried out by an enterprising company in this city whose enormous vans will remove the whole furniture of a drawing-room almost as it stands without packing my chief difficulty is with the fulcrum but that is a difficulty that met the philosopher of old you have heard of archimedes william the man who said he could make a lever big enough to move the world if he could only get a fulcrum to rest it on but archimedes was weak in that point 
he ought to have known that even if he did get such a fulcrum he would still have required another world as long as his lover to enable him to walk out to the end of it no by the way he might have walked on the lever itself that did not occur to me before he might even have ridden along it come that's a new idea let me see in order to better see mr tippet dropped the piece of wood from his left hand and pressed his fingers into both eyes so as to shut out all earthly objects and enable him to take an undistracted survey of the chambers of his mind returning suddenly from the investigation he exclaimed yes william i don't quite see my way to it but i can perceive dimly the possibility of archimedes having so formed his lever that a line of rails might have been run along the upper side of it from the fulcrum to the other end yes sir exclaimed willie who having become excited was entering eagerly into his patron's speculations and venting an occasional remark in the height of his enthusiasm such a thing might be done continued mr tippet emphatically a small carriage on the galvano hydraulic principle of course might run to and fro with passengers suggested willie well with passengers assented mr tippet smiling of course the lever would be very large extremely large yes there might be passengers and stations along the line said willie mr tippet knitted his brows e yes why not he said slowly of course the lever would be very long extremely long and it might be necessary to stop the carriages on the way out there might be breadth sufficient on the lever to plant small side stations and twenty minutes allowed for refreshments suggested willie why as to that said mr tippet if we stop at all there could be no reasonable objection to refreshments although it is probable we might find it difficult to get any one sufficiently enterprising to undertake the supply of such a line for you know if the lever were to slip at the fulcrum and fall oh exclaimed willie wouldn't there be a smash neither the danger of people falling off too continued mr tippet might be prevented by railings run along the extreme edges of the lever yes interrupted willie whose vivid imagination unused to such excitement had taken the bit in its teeth and run away with him and spikes put on em to keep the little boys from swinging on em and getting into mischief oh what jolly fun it would be only think we'd advertise cheap excursion trains along the archimedes line mondays and tuesdays fares two hundred pounds fust class no seconds or parleys allowed for love or money starts from the fulcrum the fulcrum said mr tippet correcting fulcrum station resumed willie at two thirty a m of the morning precisely stops at the quarter half-way and three-quarter stations allowing twenty minutes more or less for grub weather permitting here observations are quaint said mr tippet with a smile there is a great deal of truth in them no doubt the connection of such ideas especially as put by you sounds a little ludicrous but when we come to analyze them we see their possibility for if a lever of the size indicated by the ancient philosopher were erected and theoretically the thing is possible then the subordinate arrangements as to the line of railway and stations etc would be mere matters of detail it might be advertised too that the balance of the lever would be so regulated that on the arrival of the train at the terminus the world would arise a fact which might be seen by the excursionists by the aid of enormous telescopes much better than by the people at home and that on the return of the train the world would again sink to its ancient level there would be considerable risk no doubt continued mr tippet meditatively a foolish young men and boys getting over the rails in sport or bravado and falling off into the depths of illimitable profundity but we could have bobby stationed along the line interrupted willie and tickets put up warning the passengers not to give em money on no account whatsomever on pain of being charged double fare for the first offence and pitched over the rails on to illimitable pro was his name for the second i'll tell you what it is william mr tippet suddenly getting off the bench and seizing the boy's hand 
your talents would be wasted in my office you'll come and assist me here in the workshop i'm greatly in want of an intelligent lad who can use his hands but by the way can you use your hands here cut this piece of wood smooth with that knife he handed willie a piece of cross-grained wood and a blunt knife willie looked at both smiled and shook his head it would take a cleverer feller than me to do it but i'll try willie did try after a quarter of an hour spent in vain attempts he threw down the wood and knife exclaiming it's impossible mr tippet who had been smiling cherubically and nodding approval said i knew it was impossible my lad when i gave it to you and i now know that you are both neat-handed and persevering so if you choose i'll engage you on the spot to come on trial for a week after that we will settle the remuneration meanwhile shake hands again and allow me to express to you my appreciation of the noble character of your brother who i understand from my sister's letter saved a young relative of mine from the midst of imminent danger good night william and come to me on monday next at nine o'clock in the morning willie was somewhat perplexed at this prompt dismissal for mr tippet had opened the door especially after such a long and free and easy conversation and he felt that however much license mr tippet might permit he was a man of stern will who could not be resisted with impunity so although he was burning to know the object and nature of innumerable strange pieces of mechanism in the workshop he felt constrained to make a polite bow and depart on his way downstairs he heard the voices of men as if in angry disputation and on reaching the next floor found mr barrett standing at the open door of his room endeavouring to hold ned hooper who was struggling violently i tell you said the latter in a drunken voice that i w will go out come ned not to-night you can go to-morrow said barrett soothingly yet maintaining his hold of his friend well why not ain't night the best time to to be jolly eh let me go i say he made a fierce struggle at this point and barrett ceasing to expostulate seized him with a grasp that he could not resist and dragged him forcibly yet without unnecessary violence into the room next instant the door was shut with a bang and locked so willie wilders descended to the street and turned his face homewards moralizing as he went on the evils of drink it was a long way to notting hill but it was not long enough to enable willie to regain his wonted nonchalance he had seen and heard too much that night to permit of his equilibrium being restored he pursed his mouth several times in the form of a round o and began rule britannia but the sounds invariably died at the part where the charter of the land is brought forward he tried the bay of biscay o with no better success never being able to get farther than lightning's vivid powers before his mind was up in the clouds or in mr tippet's garret or out on the archimedes lever railway thus wandering in dreams he reached home talked wildly to his anxious mother and went to bed in the state of partial insanity end of chapter eleven recording by xena blue Chapter Twelve of Fighting the Flames. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zena Blue. Fighting the Flames by R. M. Valentine. Chapter Twelve. One night, not long after the events narrated in the last chapter, Frank Wilders was standing with the fireman in charge in the King Street station. He had just removed his helmet, and the perspiration on his brow showed that he had been but recently engaged in some active duty, as indeed was the case, for he had just returned from a walk to a fire in Whitechapel. It was only a small affair, said Frank hanging up his helmet and axe and sitting down to fill his pipe a low beer shop in brook street the tap room burnt out and the rest of the house damaged by smoke 
It was pretty well over before I got there, and I left half an hour after. Where are the rest of the lads? They're out with both engines, said Baxmore, who was busy making a memorandum on a slate. With both engines, said Frank. Aye, both, replied Baxmore, with a laugh, as he sat down in front of the fire. Let me see, it's now nine o'clock, so they've been off an hour, one to Walton Street, Brompton, the other to Porchester Terrace, Bayswater. The call was the queerest I've seen for many a day. We was all sitting here smoking our pipes, as usual, when two fellers came to the door, full split, from opposite pints of the compass, and run slap into each other. They looked like gentlemen, but they was in such a state it wasn't easy to make out what sort of fish they was. One had his coat torn and his hat gone, the other had his towel pretty well blocked down to his eyes, I suppose by the people he run into on the way, and both were half mad with excitement. They both stuttered, too. That was the fun of the thing, and they seemed to think each was taken off the other, and got into a most awful rage. My opinion is that one stuttered by nature, and the other stuttered from fright. Anyhow, they both stuttered together, and a precious mess they made of it. F -f 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 fire roared one. F -f fire yelled the other. Where away? asked Mr. Dale, looking quietly at the two men, who were gasping for breath. B -b -b Brompton! B -b Bayswater! They shouted together, and then, turning fiercely on each other. The one said, N -n -n no and the other said, N -n -n no Now which is it? said Dale. And be quick, do. B-b-Brompton! B-b-Bayswater! In a breath. Then says one, I, I, s s say Brompton! And the other, he says, I, I, s s say Bayswater! At this they grew furious, and Dale tried to calm them and settle the question by asking the name of the street. W -w walton sh street cried one. P -p -p porchester t -t terrace shouted the other. N -n no 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 yes n -n no And with that, one up fist and hit the other a crack between the eyes. T'other returned on the knob, and then they closed. Before this, Mr. Dale had ordered out one of the engines, and when he heard the two streets named, it occurred to him that there might be two fires. So he ordered out the other engine, and before we got the stutterers separated, both engines were off full swing, one to Brompton, the other to Bayswater. But whether there are two fires or no is yet to be seen. Just as Baxmore concluded, the rattle of a returning engine was heard. Next moment it dashed up to the door, and the firemen, leaping off, streamed into the station, where, amid much comment and some laughter at the scene they had so recently witnessed, they hung up their helmets and crowded round the fire. "'So it was in Brompton, after all,' said Jack Williams, stirring the coals. "'But it was a small affair in a baker's shop, and we soon got it out.' "'Is the other engine back?' inquired Moxie. Here she comes to answer for herself, said Mason, as the second engine dashed up to the station, and the men were joined by their comrades. We've got it out, said Dale, sitting down before the desk to enter the particulars in his diary. It was a private house, and well alight when we got there. But the Paddington engine was playing on it, and we soon got it under. Fay, it well them stutterers didn't keep us longer else the whole house would have been burnt out entirely, observed Joe Corney, binding up a slight wound in his thumb which he had received from a splinter. Most of the men were more or less begrimed with charcoal and smoke, and otherwise bore marks of their recent sharp, though short, skirmish, but none of them deemed it necessary to remove these evidences of devotion to duty until they had refreshed themselves with a pipe. Were there people in the house? inquired Frank. A. Eh, Pickford was there with the escape got him all out before we came up, said one. Pickford said he couldn't help laughing after he got him out, at the remembrance of their faces. When he first went in, they was all sound asleep on the top floor, 
for the smoke was only beginning to show there, and the surprise they got when he jumped in among em and shouted was wonderful to behold. Not so wonderful, observed Bill Moxie, as the surprise I see a whole man o' war's crew get by the consequence o the shout o' one of their own men. When was that? Let's hear about it, Bill, said Corney, stuffing down the tobacco in his pipe and firing a battery of cloudlets into the air. "'We was in the Red Sea at the time,' said Moxie, clearing his throat. <clears> throat. "'Laying at anchor, in a precious hot time we had of it. "'There was never a cloud, a most in the sky, "'and the sun was nigh hot enough to fry the decks off the ship. "'Cook said he'd half a mind to try to roast a junk of beef at it, "'but I never heard that he managed that. We slept on decks o' nights, cause you might as well have tried to sleep in a baker's oven as sleep below. The thing that troubled us most at that time was a tiger we had on board. It did kick up such a shindy sometimes. We thought it would break its cage and make a quit of some of us. I forget who sent it to us. Perhaps it was the Pasha of Egypt. Anyhow, we weren't sorry when the order was given to put the tiger ashore. Well, that same day that we got rid of the tiger, we was sent aboard a melee ship to flog one of the men. He'd been up to some mischief, and his comrades were afraid, I suppose, to flog him, and as the offense he had committed was against us somehow, I never rightly understood it myself, some of us went aboard the melee ship, tied him up, and gave him two dozen. That night the whole ship's company slept on deck as usual officers as well all but the cap'n who had gone ashore it was a tremendous hot night and a good deal darker than usual there was one man in the ship named wilson but we called him bob roarer because of a habit he had of speaking and sometimes roaring in his sleep bob lay between me and the purser that night and we slept on all right until it was getting pretty late Though there was two or three snorers that got their noses close to the deck and kept up a pretty fair imitation of a brass band. Suddenly, Bob began to dream, or took a nightmare or something, for he hit straight out with both fists, giving the purser a tap on the knob with his left, and digging his right into my bread basket with such good will that he nearly knocked all the wind out of me. At the same time, he uttered a most appalling yell. The confusion that followed is past description. Some of us thought it was the tiger who broke loose, forgetting that it had been sent ashore. Bob sneaked off the moment he found what he'd done, and the purser, thinking it was pirates, grabbed the first he could lay a hold of by the throat, and that was me. So to it we went, f tooth and nail, for I had no notion who was pitching into me it was so dark. Two of the men, in their fright, sprang up the main shrouds. Two others, who were asleep in the main top, were awoke by the row, looked down on the starboard side, and saw the two coming up. Thinking it was the friends of the melee who had been flogged coming to be revenged, they ran down the port shrouds like mad, and one of them rushed along the port deck, sticking his feet into the bread baskets of all the sleepers that hadn't been woke by the yell rousing them up and causing them to roar like bosuns. The row woke the cook, who was a nigger. He, thinking it was a sudden jollification, seized one of the coppers and began to beat it with an iron spoon. This set up the quartermaster, who rushed along the starboard deck, tramping upon the breasts and faces of all and sundry. The gunner thought it was the tiger and took to the top of the awning, while the doctor and Bosnan's mate, they jumped over the side and hung on by ropes up to their waists in water. At the worst of the confusion, the cap'n came aboard. We didn't see him, but he ordered silence, and after a while we discovered there was no reason whatever for the shindy. It wasn't until a long time afterwards that we found out the real cause of the false alarm. But the only man that got no fright that night and kept quite cool was the man who set it all a-going, Bob Roar. "'What a feller you are, Bill, to talk blarney,' said Corney, rising and knocking the ashes out of his pipe. "'Sure, either your father or your mother 
must have been an Irishman. Blarney or no Blarney, them's the facts, said Moxy, yawning, and I'm off to bed. Ditto, said Frank, stretching himself. The two trestles, which were always removed from the room during the day, had been brought in, and were by this time occupied by Mason and Williams, whose duty it was to keep watch that night. Baxmore, the sub-engineer of the station, sat down at the desk to read over the events of the day, and the others rose to leave. "'By the way, Baxmore,' said Dale, "'what was that false alarm at 2 p.m. when I was down at Watling Street?' "'Only a chemist in Kensington who, it seems, is mad after making experiments, "'and all but blew the roof off his house with one of them. "'Ah, uh, only smoke, I suppose,' said Dale. "'That was all,' said Baxmore. "'But there was such a lot of it that some fellows thought it was a fire "'and came tearing down here with the news, so we had a ride for nothing.' "'If I'm not mistaken, you'll have a ride for something ere long,' observed Dale, turning his head aside, while he listened attentively. "'Hold on, lads, a minute.' There was a sound of wheels in the distance, as if some vehicle were approaching at a furious pace. On it came, louder and louder, until it turned the corner of the street, and the horses' feet rattled on the stones as they were pulled up sharp at the station. Instantly the bell was rung violently, and a severe kicking was bestowed on the door. It is needless to say that the summons was answered promptly. Some of the men quietly resumed the helmets they had just hung up, well knowing that work lay before them. A cabman darted through the door the instant it was open, shouting, Fire! Where? asked Dale. Fourth Street. Holborn, sir, cried the cabman. Again, for the third time that night, the order was given to get her out. While this was being done, Baxmore took a leathern purse from the cupboard and gave the cabman a shilling for being first to give the call. As the men were already accoutred, the engine left the station on this occasion in less than five minutes. The distance was short, so the pace was full speed, and in an incredibly short space of time they drew up in front of a large, handsome shop from the first floor windows of which thick smoke and a few forked flames were issuing end of chapter 12 recording by zena blue chapter 13 of fighting the flames this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zena Blue. Fighting the Flames, Chapter 13 Quick though they were, however, in reaching the scene of the fire, the escape was there before them. It had a shorter way to travel, and was already pitched, with its head resting against a window of the second floor, and the fly-ladder raised to the third. The people who had crowded round the building at the first alarm of fire were looking on as if in suspense, and the firemen knew that Conductor Forrest, or one of his lion-hearted comrades, was inside, doing his noble and dangerous work. But they had no time to pay attention to what was going on. While some of the firemen got the engine into play, the others ran in a body to the front door of the burning house, the lower part of which was Coach Builder's warehouse. It was a heavy double door, locked and barred, and the owner had not yet arrived with the key. It was evident that the fire had originated in one of the upper floors, for there was no light in the ware room. "'Get the pole-axe,' said Dale, as soon as he found the door was fast. Frank Wilders sprang off at the word, and returned with an axe of the largest size, attached to a handle nearly four feet long. "'Drive it in, Wilders,' said Dale. Frank's powerful blows at once thundered on the massive door, but they fell on it in vain, for it was unusually strong. Seeing this, Dale ran back to the engine and got out the pole. "'Come lay hold, some of you,' said he. Immediately, eight firemen, Frank and Dale being at the front, 
charged the door like a thunderbolt with this extemporized battering ram it gave way with a prodigious crash and the whole party fell over each other into the warehouse there was a burst of laughter from themselves as well as from the crowd but in another moment they were up and swarming through the premises among the smoke searching for a point of attack send the branch up here cried mason coughing violently sure my peepers is out entirely gasped corney rushing to the window for air while showers of water fell on his head for the engine was already in full play just then there was a noise outside as if men were disputing violently dale guessed at once what it was and ran down the staircase calling out as he passed here wilders corney baxmore lend a hand will you on reaching the engine they found about a dozen roughs of the lowest character disputing fiercely as to which of them was to pump the engine as each man received one shilling an hour for this work it became a desirable means of earning a good night's wages to these broad-shouldered rascals who in their anger and in spite of the police and the solitary firemen who superintended the engine had actually caused the men already at work to cease pumping we may remark in passing that this would not have been the case but for the police force from some unknown cause being not very strong at that fire and having an excited and somewhat turbulent crowd to keep in order as a general rule the police of london are the most essential service at fires and not a few of them have obtained the medals of the society for the protection of life from fire and other rewards for gallantry displayed in saving life at the risk of their own lives on the present occasion however the few policemen present could barely hold their ground against such a band of stalwart desperadoes so the firemen came to the rescue in the front of the rough stood a man who was stronger made and better dressed than the others he had not been pugnacious at first but having got involved in the riot he struck out with the rest dale sprang at this man who was none other than the half nautical individual already introduced to the reader by the name of gorman and launched a left-hander at his head but gorman stepped aside and one of his comrades was felled instead at this the others made a rush in a body at dale but frank corney and baxmore came up at the moment and each knocked down a man instantly dale seized an instrument from the engine named a preventer like a large boat hook and raising it at the full stretch of his powerful arms he brought it swoop down on the heads of the roughs six of whom including gorman measured their length on the ground meanwhile bill moxie and jack williams who had charge of the branch which is considered the post of honor at a fire had paid no attention whatever to this little episode but the instant the order was given had conveyed their branch into the building and up to the first floor where they thought they could reach the fire more directly for it is an axiom in fire brigades to get into a burning building without delay and attack the fire at its heart they got the hose up a staircase and began to play through a doorway at the head of it but to their surprise did not make any impression whatever two other engines however were at work by this time so the fire was kept in check something wrong here said moxie speaking with difficulty owing to the dense smoke owing to the same cause it was impossible to see what was wrong i'll go in and see said mason dropping on his hands and knees and creeping into the room with his mouth as close to the ground as possible this he did because in a room on fire there is always a current of comparatively fresh air at the floor presently the sound of mason's small hatchet was heard cutting up woodwork and in a few seconds he rushed out almost choking there he said stick the branch through that hole you've been playing all this time up again a board partition moxie and williams advanced put the branch through the partition and the result was at once obvious in the diminution of smoke and increase of steam while these incidents were occurring outside and inside the building the crowd was still waiting in breathless expectation for the reappearance of conductor forrest of the fire escape for the events just narrated although taking a long time to tell were enacted in a few minutes 
Presently, Forrest appeared at the window of the second floor, with two infants in his arms. Instead of sending these down the canvas trough of the escape in the usual way, at the risk of their necks, for they were very young, he clasped them to his breast, and plunging into it himself, head foremost, descended in that position, checking his speed by spreading out his knees against the sides of the canvas. Once again he sprang up the escape amid the cheers of the people, and re-entered the window. At that moment the attention of the crowd was diverted by the sudden appearance of a man at one of the windows of the first floor. He was all on fire, and had evidently been aroused to his awful position unexpectedly, for he was in such confusion that he did not observe the fire escape at the other window. After shouting wildly for a few seconds and tossing his arms in the air, he leaped out and came to the ground with stunning violence. Two policemen extinguished the fire that was about him, and then, procuring a horse cloth, lifted him up tenderly and carried him away. It may perhaps surprise the reader that this man was not roused sooner by the turmoil and noise that was going on around him, but it is a fact that heavy sleepers are sometimes found by the firemen sound asleep and in utter ignorance of what has been going on, long after a large portion of the houses in which they dwell have been in flames. When Forrest entered the window the second time, he found the smoke thicker than before, and had some difficulty in groping his way, for smoke that may be breathed with comparative ease is found to be very severe on the eyes. He succeeded, however, in finding a woman lying insensible on the floor of the room above. In carrying her to the window, he fell over a small child, which was lying on the floor in a state of insensibility. Grasping the ladder with his left hand, he seized its nightdress with his teeth, and, with the woman on his shoulder, appeared on top of the fly ladder, which he descended in safety. The cheers and shouts of the crowd were deafening as Forrest came down. But the woman, who had begun to recover, said that her brother was in a loft above the room in which she had been found. The conductor, therefore, went up again, got on the roof of the house, broke through the tiles, and, with much difficulty, pulled the man through the aperture and conveyed him safely to the ground. Note 1. It is perhaps right to state here that a deed similar to this in nearly every point was performed by conductor Samuel Wood, a member of the London Fire Escape Brigade, for which he received a testimonial signed by the then Lord Mayor, and a silver watch with twenty pounds from the inhabitants of Whitechapel. Wood saved nearly two hundred lives by his own personal exertions. Many of his brave comrades have also done deeds that are well worthy of record, but we have not space to do more than allude to them here. The firemen were already at Forrest's heels, and as soon as he dragged the man through the hole in the roof, Frank and Baxmore jumped into it with a branch and immediately attacked the fire. By this time all the engines of the district in which the fire had occurred, and one from each of the two adjoining districts, had arrived, and were in full play, and one by one the individual men from the distant stations came dropping in and reported themselves to Dale. Mr. Braidwood not being present on that occasion. There was thus a strong force of fresh firemen on the ground, and these, as they came up, were sent in military parlance to relieve skirmishers. The others were congregated in front of the door, moving quietly about, looking on and chatting in undertones. Such of the public as arrived late at the fire no doubt formed a very erroneous impression in regard to these men for not only did they appear to be lounging about doing nothing, but they were helped by one of their number to a glass of brandy, such of them at least as chose to take it. But those who had witnessed the fire from the beginning knew that these men had toiled, with every nerve and muscle strained, for upwards of an hour in the face of almost unbearable heat, half suffocated by smoke and drenched by hot water. They were resting now, and they had much need of rest for some of them had come out of the burning house almost fainting from exposure to heat and smoke. Indeed, Mason had fainted, but the fresh air soon revived him, and after a glass of brandy he recovered sufficiently to be fit for duty again in half an hour. Frank and Baxmore were the last to be relieved. When two fresh men came up and took the branch, they descended the stairs, and a strange descent it was. 
the wooden stair or flight of open steps which they had to descend first was burnt to charcoal and looked as if it would fall to pieces with a touch i hope it'll bear said frank to baxmore who went first bear or not bear we must go down said baxmore he went unhesitatingly upon it and although the steps bent ominously there was enough of sound wood to sustain him the second stair also of wood had not been quite so much charred but so great was the quantity of water poured continuously into the house that it formed a regular water course of the staircase down which heaps of plaster and bricks and burnt rubbish had been washed and had stuck here and there forming obstructions on which the water broke and round which it roared in the form of what might have been a very respectable mountain torrent with this striking difference that the water which rushed down it was hot in consequence of it having passed through such glowing materials the lower staircase was a stone one the worst of all stairs in a fire owing to its liability to crack at its connection with the wall from the combined influence of heat and cold water just as the two men reached the head of it it fell without warning in a mass of ruins never mind said baxmore the fire escape is still at the window so saying he ran through the smoke and reached it frank was about to follow when he observed a shut door without having any definite intention he laid hold of the handle and found that it was locked on the inside he knew that for he saw the end of the key sticking through the keyhole at once he threw his weight on it and burst it open to his amazement he found a little old lady sitting quietly but in great trepidation in an easy chair partially clothed in very scanty garments which she had evidently thrown on in great haste go away young man she screamed drawing a shawl tightly round her go away i say how dare you sir why ma'am cried frank striding up to her the house is on fire come i'll carry you out no no she cried pushing him resolutely away what carry me out thus i know it's on fire leave me sir i command you i entreat you i will rather die than appear as i am in public the poor lady finished off with a loud shriek for frank seeing how matters stood and knowing there was not a moment to lose plucked a blanket from the bed overwhelmed her in it and exclaiming forgive me ma'am lifted her gently in his arms bore her through the smoke down the escape to the street carried her into a neighboring house the door of which was opportunely open and laid her like a bundle on one of the beds where he left her with strict injunctions to the people of the house to take care of her frank then went out to rejoin his comrades and refreshed himself with a glass of beer while baxmore being a teetotaler recruited his energies with a glass of water by this time the fire had been pretty well subdued but there were some parts smouldering about the roof and upper floor that rendered it necessary to keep the engines going while the firemen hunted their foe from room to room and corner to corner extinguishing him everywhere not however before he had completely gutted the whole house with the exception of part of the ground floor keep away from the walls men said dale coming up to the group who were resting at that moment there was a cry raised that someone was in the cellars at that word baxmore ran into the house and descended to the basement there was little smoke here but from the roof water was running down in a thick warm shower which drenched him in a few minutes he ran through the whole place but found no one until he opened the door of a closet where he discovered two old women who had taken refuge there one being deaf and the other lame as her crutches testified they were up to the knees in water and the same element was pouring in continuous streams on their heads yet like the old lady upstairs they refused to move or be moved finding that persuasion was useless baxmore ran up for a horse-cloth and returning threw it over the head of the deaf old woman whom he bore kicking violently into the street the other was carried out in the same fashion only that she screamed violently being unable to kick soon after that the fire was completely extinguished and the engines and men returned to their several stations leaving london once again in comparative repose end of chapter 13 
Recording by Zena Blue. Chapter Fourteen of Fighting the Flames. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zena Blue. Fighting the Flames. Chapter Fourteen. When we said that the firemen returned to their respective stations. It must not be supposed that the house which had been burnt was left in forlorn wretchedness. No, one of the firemen remained to watch over it, and guard against the upstarting of any sneaking spark that might have managed to conceal itself. The man selected for this duty was Joe Corney. Unfortunately for Joe, this was the only part of a fireman's duty that he did not relish. Joe Corney was both by nature and education, very superstitious. He believed implicitly in ghosts, and knew that an innumerable host of persons, male and female, who had seen people who said they had seen ghosts. He was too honest to say he had ever seen a ghost himself, but he had been very near seeing one two or three times, and he lived in perpetual expectation and dread of meeting one face to face before he died. Joe was as brave as a lion, and faced danger, and sometimes even what appeared to be certain death, with as much unflinching courage as the bravest of his comrades. Once, in particular, he had walked with a branch in his hands along the burning roof of a tottering warehouse near the docks, in order to gain a point from which he could play the flames so as to prevent them from spreading to the next warehouse, and so check a fire which might have easily become one of the great fires of London. Joe was therefore a man who could not be easily frightened, yet Joe trembled in his shoes when he had the most distant prospect of meeting with a ghost. There was no help for it, however. He had been appointed to watch the ruin, and being a man who cherished a strong sense of duty, he set himself doggedly to make the most of his circumstances. It was past one o'clock when the fire was finally extinguished. A few night birds and late revelers still hung about it, as if in the hope that it would burst forth again and afford them fresh excitement. But before two o'clock, everyone had gone away, and Joe was left alone with his preventer and lantern. Even the policeman on the beat appeared to avoid him, for although he passed the ruin at regular intervals on his rounds, he did not stop at it beyond a few moments to see that the fireman's lantern was burning and all right. Corny, me lad, Joe said to himself. It's bad luck as befallen ye this night, but face your luck like a man now and shame it. Encouraging himself thus, he grasped his preventer and pulled about the debris in various places of which he had some suspicion. But the engines had done their work so effectually that not a spark remained. Then Joe walked up and down and in and out for an hour studied the half-consumed pictures that still hung on the walls of one of the lower rooms which had not been completely destroyed moralized on the dire confusion and ruin that could be accomplished in so short a space of time reflected on the probable condition of the unfortunates who had been burnt out on the mutability of human affairs in general and wondered what his old mother would think of him if she saw him in his forlorn situation this latter thought caused his mind to revert to ghosts, but he was comforted by hearing the slow, distant footfall of the policeman. On it came, not unlike the supposed step of an unearthly visitant, until the guardian of the night stood revealed before him on the other side of the road. "'It's a cold night entirely,' cried Corney. "'It is,' responded the policeman. "'How goes the enemy?' inquired the fireman. "'Just gone three, replied the other. The policeman's voice, although gruff, was good-humored and hearty, but he was evidently a strict disciplinarian, for he uttered no other word and passed on. "'Fay, I'm getting sleepy,' remarked Joe to himself with a loud yawn. "'I'll go and rest a bit.' So saying, he re-entered the ruin, 
and with the aid of his lantern sought about for the least uncomfortable apartment on the ground floor he selected one which was comparatively weather tight that is to say only one of the windows had been dashed out and the ceiling was entire with the exception of a hole about four feet wide through which the charred beams above could be seen depicted against the black sky there was about an inch of water on the floor but this was a small matter for joe's boots were thick and strong the door too had been burst off its hinges and lay on the floor but joe could raise this and place it in its original position the room had been a parlor and there were several damaged prints hanging on the walls besides a quantity of detached paper hanging from them most of the furniture had been removed at the commencement of the fire but a few broken articles remained and one big old easy chair which had either been forgotten or deemed unworthy of removal by the men of the salvage corps note one the salvage corps is a body of men appointed by the insurance offices to save and protect goods at fires and otherwise to watch over their interests they wear a uniform and helmets something like those of the firemen and generally follow close in their wake in their own vans when fires break out joe wheeled the chair to the fireplace not that there was any fire in it on the contrary it was choked up with fallen bricks and mortar and the hearth was flooded with water but as joe remarked to himself it felt more home-like and sociable to sit with one's feet on the fender having erected the door in front of its own doorway joe leaned his preventer against the wall placed his lantern on the chimney-piece and sat down to meditate he had not meditated long when the steady draught of air from the window at his back began to tell upon him ugh but it's a cold wind he said i'll try the other side there's nothing like facing one's enemies acting on this idea he changed his position turning his face to the window and his back to the door well he remarked on sitting down again there's about as much draught from the door but you've improved your sedivation corny for haven't ye the elegant prospect of over the way through the windy not long after this joe's mind became much affected with ghostly memories this condition was aggravated by an intense desire to sleep for the poor man had been worked hard that day and stood much in need of repose he frequently fell asleep and frequently awoke on falling asleep his helmet performed extremely undignified gyrations on awaking he always started opened his eyes very wide looked round inquiringly then smiled and resumed a more easy position but awake or asleep his thoughts always ran in the same channel during one of those waking moments joe heard a sound which rooted him to his seat with horror and would doubtless have caused his hair to stand on end if the helmet would have allowed it the sound was simple enough in itself however being slight slow and regular it was only horrible in joe's mind because of his being utterly unable to account for it or to conceive what it could be whatever the sound was it banished sleep from his eyes for at least a quarter of an hour at last unable to stand the strain of uncertainty he arose drew his hatchet took down his lantern and coughing loudly and sternly as though to say have a care i am coming removed the door and went cautiously into the passage where the sound appeared to come from it did not cease on his appearing but went on slowly and steadily and louder than before it appeared to be at his very elbow yet joe could see nothing and a cold perspiration broke out on him oh how i could only see it he gasped just as he said this he did see it for a turn of his lantern revealed the fact that a drop of water fell regularly from one of the burnt beams upon a large sheet of paper which had been torn from the passage wall this resting on the irregular rubbish formed a sort of drum which gave forth a hollow sound and then but ye are a goose joe corny me boy said the fireman as he turned away with an amiable smile and resumed his seat after replacing the door about this time the wind began to rise and came in irregular gusts at each gust the door was blown from the wall an inch or so and fell back with a noise that invariably awoke joe with a start he looked around each time quickly 
but as the door remained quiet he did not discover the cause of his alarm after it had done this several times joe became so to speak desperately courageous get out with ye he cried angrily on being startled again wasn't the last one all sham and sure you're the same go long in pace and good night as he said this the overtaxed man fell asleep at the same moment a heavy gust of wind drove the door in altogether and dashed it down on his head fortunately being somewhat charred the panel that struck his helmet was driven out so that joe came by no greater damage than the fright which caused his heart to bound into his throat for he really believed that the ghost had got him at last relieving himself on the door which he laid on the floor lest it should play him the same prank over again joe corney once more settled himself in the easy chair and resolved to give his mind to meditation just then the city clocks pealed forth the hour of four o'clock this is perhaps the quietest hour of the twenty-four in london before this most of the latest revellers have gone home and a few of the early risers are moving there was one active mind at work at that hour however namely that of gorman who after recovering from the blow given him by dale went to his own home on the banks of the thames in the unaristocratic locality of london bridge gorman owned a small boat and did various kinds of businesses with it but gorman's occupations were numerous and not definite he was everything by turns and nothing long when visible to the outward eye and that wasn't often his chief occupations were loafing about and drinking on the present occasion he drank a great deal more than usual and lay down to sleep vowing vengeance against firemen in general and dale in particular two or three hours later he awoke and leaving his house crossed london bridge and wended his way back to the scene of the fire without any definite intention but with savage desires in his breast he reached it just at that point where joe corney had seated himself to meditate as above described joe's powers of meditation were not great at any time at that particular time they were exerted in vain for his head began to sway backward and forward and to either side despite his best efforts to the contrary waiting in the shadow of a doorway until the policeman should pass out of sight and hearing and cautiously stepping over the debris that encumbered the threshold of the burnt house gorman peeped into the room where the light told him that someone kept watch great was his satisfaction and grim his smile when he saw that a stalwart fireman sat there apparently asleep being only able to see his back he could not make certain who it was but from the bulk of the man and the breadth of the shoulders he concluded that it was dale anyhow it was one of his enemies and that was sufficient for gorman's nature was of that brutal kind that he would risk his life any day in order to gratify his vengeance and it signified little to him which of his enemies fell in his way so long as it was one of them taking up a brick from the floor he raised himself to his full height and dashed it down on the head of the sleeping man just at that moment corney's nodding head chanced to fall forward and the brick only hit the comb of his helmet knocking it over his eyes next moment he was grappling with gorman as on previous occasions joe's heart had leaped to his throat and that the ghost was upon him at last he had no manner of doubt but no sooner did he feel the human arm of gorman and behold his face than his native courage returned with a bound he gave his antagonist a squeeze that nearly crushed his ribs together and at the same time hurled him against the opposite wall but gorman was powerful and savage he recovered himself and sprang like a tiger on joe who received him in a warm embrace with an irish yell the struggle of the two strong men was for a few moments terrible but not doubtful for joe's muscles had been brought into splendid training at the gymnastics he soon forced gorman down on one knee but at the same moment a mass of brickwork which had been in a toppling condition and was probably shaken down by the violence of their movements fell on the floor above broke through it and struck both men to the ground joe lay stunned and motionless for a few seconds for a beam had hit him on the head but gorman leaped up and made off a moment or two before the entrance of the policeman who had run back to the house on hearing joe's war-whoop 
It is needless to add that Joe spent the remainder of his vigil that night in an extremely wakeful condition, and that he gave a most graphic account of his adventure with the ghosts on his return to the station. End of chapter 14 Recording by Zena Blue Chapter 15 of Fighting the Flames This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zena Blue Fighting the Flames by R. M. Ballantyne Chapter 15 Mother, said Master William Wilders one night to his parent, as he sat at supper, which meal consisted of bread and milk. He's the jolliest old feller that Mr. Tippet I ever come across. I'm glad you like him, Willie, said Mrs. Wilders, who was busy patching the knees of a pair of small unmentionables. But I wish, dear, that you would not use slang in your speech, and remember that fellow is not spelled with an E-R at the end of it. Come now, mother, don't you go and get sarcastic. It don't suit you. Besides, there's no occasion for it, for I do my best to keep it down, but I'm so choked full of it that a word or two will spurt up now and then in spite of me. Mrs. Wilder smiled and continued her patching. Willie grinned and continued his supper. Mother, said Willie, after an interval of silence. Well, my son, what do ye think of the old feller? Ah, uh, I mean fellow, is up to just now. I don't know, Willie. He's inventin' a calculatin' machine, as it is to do anything from simple addition to fractions. And he says if it works, well, he'll carry it on to algebra and mathematics, up to the fismal, calculus, or something of that sort. Oh, you've no notion how he strains himself at it. He sits down in his shirt sleeves at a writing table he's got in the corner and tears away at the little hair he has on the sides of his head. I do believe he tore it all off the top with them inventions. Then he bangs up and he seizes his tools and shouts, Look here, Willie, hold on, and goes sawing and chiseling and hammering away like a steam engine. He's all but busts himself over that calculatin' machine, and I'm much afraid that he'll clap chips into the sausage machine some day, just to see how it works. I hope he won't, for Chips and I are great friends, though we've only been in a month together. I hope he's a good man, said Mrs. Wilders thoughtfully. Well, I'm sure he must be, cried Willie with enthusiasm, for he is very kind to me and also to many poor folk that come about him regularly. I'm getting to know their faces now, and when to suspect them. He always takes them in his back room, all sorts, old men and old women and children, most of them seedy enough, but some of them well off to look at. What he says to them, I don't know, but they usually come out very grave and go away thanking him, and saying they won't forget his advice. If the advice is to come back soon, they certainly don't forget it. And he's a great philosopher, too, mother, for he often talks to me about my intellects. He says just the other day, Willie, said he, get into a habit o' using your brains, my boy. The Almighty put us in this world well-made machines, intended to be used in all our parts. Now you'll find thousands of people who use their muscles and neglect their brains, and thousands of others who use their brains and neglect their muscles. Both are wrong, boy. We're machines, lad, wonderful machines, and the machines won't work well if they're not used all over. Don't that sound grand, mother? Willie might have received an answer if he had waited for one, but he was too impatient and went rattling on. And who do you think, mother, came to see old Tippet the other day but little Catley, the clown's boy? You remember my telling you about little Catley in the auction, don't you? Yes, Willie. 
Well, he came, and just as he was going away, I ran out and asked him how the fairy was. She's very ill, he said, shaking his head and looking so mournful that I had not the heart to ask more. But I'm going to see them, mother. That's right, my boy, said Mrs. Wilders, with a pleased look. I like to hear you talk of going to see people in distress. Blessed are they that consider the poor, Willie. Oh, as to that, you know, I don't know that they are poor, only I feel sort of sorry for em somehow, and I'm awful anxious to see a real live fairy, even though she is ill. When are you going? inquired Mrs. Wilders. Tomorrow night, on my way home. Did you look in at Frank's lodging in passing tonight? Yes, I did, and found that he was in the station on duty again. It wasn't a bad sprain, you see, and it'll teach him not to go jumping out of a first-floor window again. He couldn't help it, said the widow. You know his escape by the stair had been cut off, and there's no other way left. No other way, cried Willie. Why didn't he drop? He's so proud of his strength, his blazes, that he jumped off hand a purpose to show it. Ha! He'd be the better of some of my caution. Now, Mother, I'm off to bed. Get the Bible, then, said Mrs. Wilders. Willie got up and fetched a large old family Bible from a shelf, and laid it on the table before his mother, who read a chapter and prayed with her son after which Willie gave her one of his roistering kisses and went to bed. The lamps had been lighted for some time next night, and the shop windows were pouring forth their bright rays, making the streets appear as light as day, when Willie found himself in the small, disreputable street near London Bridge in which Catley the Clown dwelt. Remembering the directions given to him by little Jim Catley, he soon found the underground abode near the burnt house, the ruins of which had already been cleared away, and a considerable portion of a new tenement erected. If the stair leading to the clown's dwelling was dark, the passage at the foot of it was darker, and as Willie groped his way carefully along, he might have imagined it to be a place inhabited only by rats or cats had not gleams of light and the sound of voices from sundry closed doors betokened the presence of human beings. Of the compound smells peculiar to the place, those of beer and tobacco predominated. At the farther end of this passage there was an abrupt turn to the left, which brought the boy unexpectedly to a partially open door, where a scene so strange met his eyes that he involuntarily stood still and gazed. In a corner of the room, which was almost destitute of furniture, a little girl, wan, weary, and thin, lay on a miserable pallet with scanty covering over her. Beside her stood Catley, not as when first introduced, in a seedy coat and hat, but in full stage costume, with three balls on his head, white face, triangular roses on his cheeks, and his mouth extended outward and upward at the corners by means of red paint. Little Jim sat on the bed beside his sister, clad in pink skin tights, with cheeks and face similar to his father, and a red crest or comb worsted on his head. Ziza, darling, are you feeling better, my lamb? said the elder clown, with a gravity of expression in his real mouth that contrasted strangely with the expression conveyed by the painted corners. No, father, not much, but perhaps I'm getting better, though I don't feel it, said the sweet, faint voice of the child as she opened her large hollow eyes and looked upward. So that's the fairy, thought Willie sadly, as he gazed on the child's beautiful though wasted features. We'll have done directly, darling, said the clown tenderly. Only one more turn, and then we'll leave you to rest quietly for some hours. Now then, here we are again, he added, bounding into the middle of the room with a wild laugh. Come along, Jim, try that jump once more. Jim did not speak but pressing his lips to his sister's brow, leaped after his sire, who was standing in a remarkably vigorous attitude, with his legs wide apart and his arms akimbo, looking back over his shoulder. 
here we go cried jim in a tiny voice running up his father's leg inside stepping lightly on his shoulder and planting one foot on his head jump down the clown said gravely jim obeyed that won't do jim you must do it all in one run no pausing on the way but whoop up you go and both feet on my head at once don't be afeard you can't tumble you know i'm not afeard father said jim but i ain't quite springy in my heart to-night stand again and see if i don't do it right off catley the elder threw himself into the required attitude and catley jr rushed at him ran up him as a cat runs up a tree and in a moment was standing on his father's head with his arms extended whoop next moment he was turning round in the air and whoop in another moment he was standing on the ground bowing respectfully to a supposed audience to jim's immense amazement the supposed audience applauded him heartedly and said bravo youngin as it stepped into the room in the person of william wilders why who may you be inquired the clown senior stepping up to the intruder before willie could answer the clown junior sprang on his father's shoulders and whispered in his ear whatever he said the result was an expression of benignity and condescension on the clown's face as far as paint would allow of such an expression glad to meet you master wilders he said proud to know anyone connected with t tippet esq who's a trump give us your flipper what may be the object of your unexpected though welcome visit to this subterraneous grotto which may be said to be next door to the coral caves where mermaids dwell yes and there's one of the mermaids singing remarked the cloud junior with a comical leer as a woman's voice was heard in violent altercation with someone she's a saying of her prayers now beseeching of her husband to let her have her own way willie explained that having had the pleasure of meeting with jim at an auction sale some weeks ago he had called to renew his acquaintance and jim said he remembered the incident and that if he was not mistaken a desire to see a live fairy in plain clothes with her wings off had something to do with his visit here she is by the way what's your name bill wilders here she is bill this is the fairy he said in quite an altered tone as he went to the bed and took one of his sister's thin hands in both of his ziza this is the feller i told ye of and wanted to see you dear belongs to mr tippet ziza smiled faintly and she extended her hand to willie who took it and pressed it gently willie felt a wonderfully strong sensation within his heart as he looked into the sufferer's large liquid eyes and for a few seconds he could not speak suddenly he exclaimed well you ain't one bit like what i expected to see you're more like an angel than a fairy ziza smiled again and said she didn't feel like either one or the other my poor lamb said the clown sitting down on the bed and parting the dark hair on ziza's forehead with a hand as gentle as that of a mother we're going now time's up shall i ask mrs smith to stay with you again till we come back oh no no cried the child hurriedly and squeezing her fingers into her eyes as if to shut out some disagreeable object not mrs smith i'd rather be alone i wish i could stay with you ziza said jim earnestly it's of no use wishing jim said his father you can't get off a single night if you was to fail em you'd lose your engagement and we can't afford that just at this time you know but i'll try to get mrs james to come she's a good woman i know and mr catley interrupted willie if you allow a particularly humble individual to make an observation i would say there's nothing in life to prevent me from keeping this ere fairy company till you come back i've nothing particular to do as i knows on and i'm rather fond of lonely meditation so if the fairy wants to go to sleep it don't make no odds to me so long as it pleases her thank you lad said the clown but you'll get wearied i fear for we won't be home till morning ah interrupted willie till daylight does appear but that's no odds neither cause i'm not married yet so there's nobody a waitin for me and he winked to jim at this point my mother knows i'm out the clown grinned at this 
you'd make one of us youngster said he if you can jump Howsever, i'm obliged by your offer so you can stay if ziza would like it ziza said she would like it with such good will that willie adored her from that moment and vowed in his heart he would nurse her till she he did not like to finish the sentence yet somehow the little that he had heard and seen of the child led him irresistibly to the conclusion that she was dying this having been satisfactorily arranged the catleys senior and junior threw cloaks round them exchanged their wigs for caps and regardless of the absurd appearance of their faces hurried out to one of the minor theatres with heavy hearts because of the little fairy left so ill and comfortless at home in a few minutes they were tumbling on the stage cracking their jokes and convulsing the house with laughter End of chapter 15 recording by Zena blue chapter 16 of fighting the flames this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Fighting the Flames by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter 16. Willie in a New Light. Left alone with the fairy, Willie Wilders began his duties as sick nurse, a sphere of action into which he had never thought of being introduced, even in his wildest dreams. He began by asking the fairy if she was all right and comfortable to which she replied that she was not, upon which he explained that he meant, was she as right and comfortable as could be expected in the circumstances? Could he do anything for her, in fact, or get her anything that would make her more comfortable than she was? But the fairy shook her poor head and said no. "'Come now, won't you have something to eat? What had you for dinner?' said Willie, in a cheery voice, looking round the room but not discovering any symptoms of food beyond a few empty plates and cups, the latter without handles, and a teapot with half a spout. "'I had a little bread and butter,' said the fairy. "'No tipple?' inquired the nurse. "'No, except water.' "'Ain't there none in the house?' "'No.' "'Do you get nothing better at other times?' inquired Willie in surprise. "'Not often.' father is very poor he was ill for a long time too and if it hadn't been for your kind master i think we should all have starved he's better now but he needs pretty good living to keep him up to his work for there's a deal of training to be done and it wears him out if he don't get meat but the pantomimes began and we were getting on better when the fire came and burnt everything we had almost so we can't afford much meat or beer and i don't like beer so i've got them persuaded to let me live on bread and butter and water i would like tea better because it's hot but we can't afford that here was a revelation the fairy lived upon bread and butter and water willie thought that but for the interpolation of the butter it would have borne marvellous resemblance to prison fare when had you dinner inquired willie suddenly i think about four o'clock and can't you eat nothing now again the fairy shook her head nor drink look if there's anything in the teapot said the fairy willie looked shook his head and said not a drop any leaves why y yes he brought the pot nearer to the candle there are a few used up ones oh do pour some hot water into it but i fear the water is cold and the fire is too low to boil it and I know the coals are done, but father gets paid a salary tomorrow, and he'll give me some tea then. He's very kind to me, father is, and so is Jim. She sighed as she spoke and shut her eyes. Ziza, said Willie in a careless tone, you won't object to my leaving you for a few minutes, only a few. I want to get a little fresh air and see what sort of a night it is. I won't be gone long. Ziza, so far from objecting, said that she was used to being left alone for long, long hours at a time and wouldn't mind it. So Willie put the candle nearer to her bedside, placed a teacup of water within reach, went out, shut the door softly behind him, 
groped his way through the passage and up the stair and got into the street that day his eccentric employer had paid him his first month's wage a sovereign with many complimentary remarks as to his usefulness the golden coin lay in his pocket it was the first he had ever earned he had intended to go straight home and lay the shining piece in his mother's lap for willie was a peculiar boy and had some strange notions in regard to the destination of first fruits where he had got them nobody could tell perhaps his mother knew but nobody ever questioned her upon the point taking this gold piece from his pocket he ran into the nearest respectable street and selected there the most respectable grocer shop into which he entered and demanded a pound of the shopman's best tea a pound of his best sugar a pound of his best butter a cut of his best bacon and one of his best wax candles willie knew nothing about relative proportion in regard to such things he only knew that they were usually bought and consumed together the shopman looked at the little purchaser in surprise but as willie emphatically repeated his demands he gave him the required articles on receiving the sovereign he looked twice at willie wrung the piece of money three times on the counter and then returned the change gathering the packages in his arms and putting the candle between his vest and bosom he went into a baker's shop purchased a loaf and returned to the subterraneous grotto laden like a bee to say that the fairy was surprised when he displayed these things would be a feeble use of language she opened her large eyes until willie begged her in alarm not to open them wider for fear they should come out at which sally she laughed and then being weak she cried after that she fell in with her nurse's humor and the two proceeded to have a night of it ziza said she'd be a real fairy and tell him what to do and willie said he'd be a gnome or a he fairy and do it at the outset willie discovered that he had forgotten coals but this was rectified by another five minutes airing and a rousing fire was quickly roaring in the chimney while the kettle sang and spluttered on it like a sympathetic thing as no doubt it was willie cleared the small table that stood at the invalid's bedside and arranged upon it the loaf the teapot two cracked teacups the butter and sugar and the wax candle which latter was stuck into a quart bottle in default of a better candlestick now ain't that jolly said the nurse sitting down and rubbing his hands very replied the patient her eyes sparkling with delight it's so like a scene in a play continued willie only much more real suggested the fairy now then ziza have a cup of tea fresh from the market o chiny as your dad would say if he was selling it by auction he's a known codger your dad is ziza there i know o'd i forgot something else the cream i don't mind it indeed i don't said ziza earnestly willie had started up to run out and rectify the submission but on being assured that the fairy liked tea almost as well without cream and that there was no cream to be got near at hand he sat down again and continued to do the honors of the table first he made the fairy sit up in bed and commented sadly on her poor thin neck as she did it observing that she was nothing better than a skeleton in a skin then he took off his own jacket and put it on her shoulders tying the arms around her neck next he placed a piece of board in front of her saying that it was a capital tray and on this he arranged the viands neatly now then go at it ziza he said when all was arranged ziza who received his attentions with looks that were wonderfully gleeful for one in her weak state of health went at it with such vigor that the bread was eaten and the tea drunk in a few minutes and the supply had to be renewed when she was in the middle of her second round of buttered toast for willie had toasted the bread she stopped suddenly why don't you go on asked willie because you have not eaten or drunk one mouthful yet but i'm looking at you and ain't that better Howsever, if you won't go on i'll not keep you back and with that willie set to work and being uncommonly hungry did what he styled 
terrible execution among the widows for some time the nurse and patient ate in comparative silence but by degrees they began to talk and as they became more confidential their talk became more personal do you like being a fairy said willie after a long the conversation no i don't replied ziza why not because because i don't like the things we have to do and and in short i don't like it at all and i often pray god to deliver me from it that's strange now said willie i would have thought it great fun to be a fairy i'd rather be a little clown or a he fairy myself now than anything else i know of except a fireman a fireman willie yes a fireman my brother blade uh frank i mean is one and he saved the lives of some people not long since of course willie here diverged into a graphic account of the fire in beverly square and seeing that ziza listened with intense earnestness he dilated upon every point and went with special minuteness into the doings of frank when he concluded ziza heaved a very deep sigh and closed her eyes i tired you ziza exclaimed willie jumping up with a look of anxiety and removing the tea-board and jacket as the child slipped down under the clothes he asked if she wanted to go to sleep yes for i am very tired she sighed languidly then added but please read to me a little first uh what book am i to read you said willie looking around the room where no book of any kind was to be seen here it's under the pillow willie put his hand under the pillow and pulled out a small pocket bible read the third chapter of st john's gospel said the child closing her eyes willie read in the monotonous tones of the schoolboy's voice until he came to the sixteenth verse for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life stop at that verse whispered ziza i'll go to sleep now her breathing soon proclaimed that she was in the land of dreams so willie removed the candle a little farther away from her and then resting his elbows on the table and his head in his hands began to read the bible he turned over a few pages without much intention of finding any particular place for he was beginning to feel sleepy the first words his eyes fell upon were blessed are they that consider the poor he roused up a little at this and read the verse again for he connected it with the fact that the fairy was poor then he pondered it for some time and falling asleep dropped his head on the bible with such force that he woke up for a little and tried to read again but do what he would he could not get beyond that verse finally he gave up the attempt and laying his forehead down upon it quickly fell sound asleep in this state the couple were discovered an hour or two later by messrs catley senior and junior on their return from the theatre inscrutable mysteries say what is this exclaimed the elder clown advancing into the room on tiptoe apostrophizing his eye and one betty martin the younger clown said that it was a rare go and no mistake whereupon his father laid his hand on willie's shoulder and gently shook him eh another cup ziza exclaimed the self-accused nurse as he put out his hand to seize the teapot oh i thought it was the fairy he added looking up with a sleepy smile i do believe i've gone and fell asleep why lad where got ye all those things inquired the senior catley laying aside his cloak and cap and speaking in a low tone for ziza was still sleeping soundly well i got em replied willie in a meditative tone from a friend of mine a very particular friend of mine as the clowns to let me mention his name so you'll have to be satisfied with the whittles and without the name of the virtuous giver perhaps it was a dork or a squire or an archbishop as it did it anyway his name warn't walker 
See now, you've been and woke up the fairy. The sick child moved as he spoke, but it was only to turn, without awaking on her side. Well, lad, said the clown, sitting down and looking wistfully in the face of his daughter, you got your own reasons for not telling me. Mayhap I have a pretty good guess. Anyhow, I say God bless him, for I do believe he saved the child's life. I've not seen her sleep like that for weeks. Look at her, Jim. Ain't she like her old self? Yes, father. She don't need no paint and flour to make a fairy on her just now. She's just like what she was the last time I seed her go up in a gauze cloud to heaven, with red and blue fire blazing all around her. I'll bid you good night now, said Willie, buttoning up his jacket to the chin and pulling his cap down on his brows with the air of a man who has a long walk before him. You're off, are you, eh? said the elder clown, rising and taking Willie by the hand. Well, you're a good lad. Thank you for coming and taking care of Ziza. My subterranean grotto ain't much to boast of, but such as it is, you're welcome to it at all times. Good night. Good night, said Willie. Good night, Jim. Jim replied good night heartily, and then Willie stepped into the dark passage. He glanced back at the fairy before shutting the door, but her eyes were closed, so he said good night to her in his heart and went home. End of chapter 16「Number Seventeen of Fighting the Flames. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zena Blue. Fighting the Flames by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter Seventeen. My dear Miss Tippet, I shall never, no, never get over it. So said, and so undoubtedly thought, a thin little old lady with remarkably bright eyes and a sweet old face as she sat sipping tea at Miss Tippet's elbow. It was in the drawing-room of Miss Demas that she sat, and the eagle sat opposite to her. It was dreadful, responded Miss Tippet with a sigh. Very. It was awful. I know I shall never get over it. Never repeated the little old lady finishing her tea and asking for another cup in the calmest possible voice with the sweetest possible smile oh yes you will mrs denman said miss demas snappishly no indeed i won't repeated mrs denman how can i just think of the situation sitting in my chair in dishabille when a man a man miss d well i know what a man is said the eagle bitterly why don't you go on burst himself through my bedroom door continued mrs denman with lime and charcoal and brick dust and water streaming down his face f f oded me in his arms bore me out into the street the street oh i shall never never get over it and so little so very little clothing on me how much had you on asked miss demas in a deep voice the calmness of which contrasted forcibly with mrs denman's excited tones really miss demas i see no necessity for going into particulars it is sufficient to know that i was carried by a man into the street in the face of some thousands of people for i heard them cheering though i saw them not i know i shall never get over it another cup my love not quite so much sugar no not if i were to live to the age of methuselah i don't wonder indeed i don't murmured the sympathetic miss tippet i think julia dear you are a little too hard on mrs denman how would you like to have been carried out of a burning house in such a way by a big rough man oh my dear interposed mrs denman i did not say he was rough big he certainly was and strong but i must do him the justice to say that the man the 
with oh me lifted me up very tenderly and carried me as though i had been an infant and he my mother through smoke and fire and water into the street before the eyes of the whole oh it's too awful to think of stuff ejaculated miss demas pecking a piece of cake out of her fingers as she would metaphorically of course have pecked the eyes out of the head of frank wilders or any other man didn't you say he put a blanket round you of course miss demas i should have died otherwise of pure shame no you wouldn't retorted the eagle you would probably have been half suffocated and a good deal dirtied and you might have been singed but you wouldn't have died and what need you care now for the people saw nothing but a bundle you might have been a bundle of old clothes for all they knew or cared all they wanted to see was the bravery as they call it of the man as if there were not hundreds upon hundreds of women who would do the same thing if their muscles were strong enough and occasion served but it was a brave act you know said miss tippet timidly i don't know that retorted miss demas helping herself to more cake with as much decision of manner as if she had been carrying it off by force of arms from before the very muzzles of a masculine battery i don't know that he had to escape you know for his own life and he might as well bring a bundle along with him as not yes but then said miss tippet he first went up the the thingamy you know no he didn't retorted miss demas smartly he was in the house at the time and only came down the thingamy as you call it it was a peculiarity of miss demas's character that she claimed the right to be as rude as she chose to people in her own house and rather prided herself on this evidence of independence in my opinion said mrs denman his being in the burning house at all of his own accord was of itself evidence of courage i think the fireman is a brave young man thus much mrs denman said with dignity to miss demas the remainder of her speech she addressed to miss tippet but my dear i feel that although i owe this young man a debt of gratitude which i can never repay i shall never be able to look my preserver in the face i know that his mind will always revert when he sees me to the fi the figure figure that he lifted out of that easy chair but there is one thing i have resolved on continued the little old lady in more cheerful tones as she asked for another cup of tea and that is to get a fireman to instruct me as to the best method of saving my own life should fire again break out in my dwelling the eagle gave a hysterical chuckle at this i have already written to one who has been recommended to me as a shrewd man and he is coming to call on me this very evening at seven o'clock mrs denman started as if her own remark had recalled something and pulled out her watch why it is almost half-past six she exclaimed rising hastily excuse a hurried departure miss demas your society and sympathy she looked pointedly at miss tippet here have been so agreeable that i did not observe how time was flying good-bye miss demas good evening dear miss tippet miss demas bowed good-bye my love said miss tippet bustling round her friend i'm so glad to have met you and i hope you'll come and see me soon six poor thing lane remember come whenever you please miss denman yes yes time does indeed fly as you say or as my friend sir Archibald, what's his name used to remark tempet fugis something re what's his name good-bye dear mrs denman while the ladies were thus engaged one whom the eagle would have tossed her beak at with supreme contempt was enjoying himself in the bosom of his family this was none other than joe corney himself who having received a stop for a distant fire had looked in on his wife to tell her of the note he had received from mrs denman the family bosom resided in a small portion of a small house in the small street where the fire engine dwelt joe had laid his helmet on the table and having flung himself into a chair seized his youngest child a little girl in his arms raised her high above his head and laughed in her face at which the child chuckled and crowed to the best of its ability 
meanwhile his oldest son joe jr immediately donned the helmet seized the poker thrust the head of it into a bucket of water and pointing the other end at a supposed fire began to work an imaginary hand pump with all his might it's going out daddy cried the urchin sure he's a true chip of the old block reserved his mother who was preparing the evening meal of the family he's uncommon fond of fire and water molly my dear said the fireman i have ye kape a sharp eye on that same chip else his fondness for fire may lead to more water than ye'd wish for i've been thinking that same meself honey replied mrs corney placing a pile of buttered toast on the table sure didn't i kitchen puttin a match to the straw bed the other day me only consolation is that every one in the house knows how to use the hand pup ah then ye won't believe it joe but i catched the baby at it this morning no later and she'd have got it to work i do believe if she hadn't tumbled right over into the bucket and all but drowned herself but you know the station's not far off if the house did get a light sure ye might run the hose from the engine to here without so much as drawing her out of the shed now then joe tay's ready so fall to joe did fall to with the appetite of a man who knows what it is to toil hard late and early joe jr laid aside the helmet and poker and did his duty at the viands like the true son of a fireman not to say an irishman and for five minutes or so the family enjoyed themselves in silence after that joe senior heaved a sigh and said that it would be about time for him to go and see the old lady what can it be she wants asked mrs corney don't know replied her husband all i know is that she's the old lady as was bundled neck and crop out of the first floor windy of the house in holborn by frank wilders she's a queer old woman that she's got two houses no less one over the coachmaker's shop the shop being her property and one in russell square they say she's rich enough to line her coffin with gould an inch thick spakin o that molly my dear a queer thing happened to me the other night it's what you call a coincidence what's that joe well tain't easy to explain but it means two things happening together in most unlikely way do you see no i don't joe replied mrs corney helping herself to another slice of toast well it don't matter much resumed joe but this is what it was mr dal and me was sitting about two in the morning at the station fire smoking our pipes for it was my turn on duty and chatting away about one thing and another when somehow we got upon telling our experiences and dal he tells me a story o how he was once called to a fire in a cemetery and had to go down among the coffins for they was a fire and what a fright some o his men got when just as he had finished and all my flesh was creeping at what i'd heard there comes a ring at the bell and a call to a fire in portland street i runs and gets out the engine and frank he was my mate that night he rings up the boys and away we went in ten minutes it wasn't far and when we got there in we went into the house which was full of smoke but no fire to be seen we went coughing and sneezing and rubbing our eyes down into the cellar where the lads of another engine was at work before us with the hand pumps and would you believe it the walls of that cellar was lined with coffins true for ye there they was all sizes as thick as they could stand i thought i was dryman but it was no dram for it was an undertaker's shop and when i went upstairs after we discovered the fire and put it out I sees two coffins on trestles lying ready for use. One was black with painted wood, no doubt for a poor man, and nothing side up. The other alongside was covered with superfine black cloth and silver mounted handles and name plate, and it was all padded and signed and lined with white satin. White satin, Joe, you're joking. As sure as your name's Molly, it was white satin, repeated Joe. I wouldn't have belayed it if I hadn't seen it, but that's the way quality goes to their graves. I looks at the two coffins, and I was coming away, and thinks I to myself, I wonder whether the poor man or the rich man will be most comfortable when they're laid there. Now, Molly, I'll bid you good night, and be off to see this old lady. 
this mrs denman look after that boy now and kape the matches out of his way whatever you do with this very needful warning joe corney kissed his wife and the baby and went off to the station to obtain leave of absence for a couple of hours End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Fighting the Flames This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zena Blue Fighting the Flames by R. M. Ballantyne Chapter 18 Wending his way through the crowded streets, Joe soon reached the door of the house in Russell Square, which belonged to Mrs. Denman. The good lady had made use of a cab after quitting Miss Demas, so that she was at home and seated in a luxuriously easy chair in her splendidly furnished drawing-room when the fireman applied the knocker. "'Does this is Denman stop here, my dear?' said Joe to the smart servant girl who opened the door yes replied the girl and she told me to show you up to the drawing-room whenever you came step this way joe pulled off his cap and followed the maid who ushered him into the presence of the little old lady pray take a chair said mrs denman pointing to one which had evidently been placed close to hers on purpose you are a fireman i understand yes ma'am i've been more nor ten years at the business now you must find it a very warm business i should imagine said mrs denman with a smile true for ye ma'am my body's been a most burnt off my soul over and over again but it's a cold enough too sometimes specially when you've got to watch the premises after the fire's been put out the cold winter night as i had to do at your house ma'am mrs denman started and turned pale what do you mean to say that you were at the fire in in holborn that night indeed i do ma'am och but you must be ill ma'am for your face is white as a ghost sure but it's red now let me shout for some water for ye ma'am no no my good man said mrs denman recovering herself a little i i the fact is it did not occur to me that you had been at that fire else i would have never but no matter you didn't see see anyone saved did you see anyone saved is it sure i did and yourself among the lot Ugh! but it's frank wilders as knows how to do a thing nately he brought ye out of the windy ma'am on his shoulder as handy as if he'd been a carpet bag or a pork mancy ma'am hush man exclaimed poor mrs denman blushing scarlet for she was a very sensitive old lady i cannot bear to think of it but how could you know it was me it might have been anything a bundle you know not by no means replied candid joe we seed your shape quite plain ma'am for the blanket was tight round ye mrs denman covered her face with her hand at this point and resting her elbow on the arm of her chair reflected that the thing was beyond remedy and that as the man had come and was now looking at her matters could not be worse so she resolved to carry out her original intention and question him as to the best course of action in the event of a fire my good man she said i have taken the liberty of asking you to come here to tell me what i should do to guard against fire in the future joe rubbed his nose and looked at the ground then he stroked his chin and looked at the old lady then a look of intelligence lighted up his expressive countenance and he said abruptly is your house and furniture insured ma'am no it is not replied mrs denman i have never insured in my life because although i hear of fires every day in london it has never occurred to me until lately that there was any probability of my house being burned i know it was very foolish of me but i shall see to having it done directly that's right ma'am said joe with an approving nod if you see the heaps and heaps of splendid furniture and goods and building as is burnt every day and most in london and lost to the owners cause they grudged a few shillings of insurance or cause they was careless and didn't believe a fire would ever come to them 
no matter how many might come to other folk you'd insure your house and furniture first thing at the morning ma'am i have no doubt what you say is quite correct mr corney and i will certainly attend to this matter in the future but i am more particularly anxious to know how i should act if the house in which i live in were to take fire get out of it as fast as possible said joe promptly and screech out fire till your sides is sore but suppose mrs denman said with a faint smile that the fire is burning in the stair and the house is full of smoke what am i to do ugh oh, i see your drift now ma'am said joe with a knowing look and is that what you wants to know i'll just with your lave ma'am give you a small discourse on the subject joe cleared his throat and began with the air of a man who knows what he is talking about it's as well ma'am to begin trying to prevent your house catching fire prevention being better nor cure if you'd keep clear of that there's two or three small matters to remember first of all take uncommon good care of your matches and don't let the children get at em if you've any in the house would you believe it ma'am there was above fifty fires in london last year that was known to have been upset alight by childers playing with the matches or by careless servants letting em drop and charting on them how many asked mrs denman in surprise fifty ma'am dear me you amaze me fireman i had supposed there were not so many fires in london in a year a year exclaimed joe why there's nearly three fires on average every twenty-four hours in london and that's about a thousand fires in a year ma'am are you sure of what you say fireman quite sure ma'am and ye can ax mr braidwood if ye don't believe me mrs denman still in a state of blank amazement said that she did not doubt him and bade him go on weel then resumed joe look well arter ye matches and never to read in bed that's the way hundreds of houses get to light when you light a candle with a bit o paper ma'am don't throw it on the floor and tramp on it and think it's out for many a times there's a small spark left and the wind as always blows along the floor sets it up and it catches something and there you are blazes and hollerin and ingins goin full swing in no time then ma'am never go for to blow out your gas and if there's an escape don't rest till you get a gas fitter and find it out but more particularly don't try to find it yourself with a candle Ugh! Oh, if you'd only see the blows up i've seen from gas ye look better arter it no more ter two weeks gone by ma'am we was called to attend a fire which was caused by an escape o gas when we got there the fire was out but it's sich a mess you never did see twas a house ma'am in the west end with the most illigant painted walls and cornices and gimcracks idged all with gould the family had just got into it no done up for em only by good luck there wasn't much of the furniture in it smelled a horrid smell o' gas for a good while but couldn't find it at last the missus she goes to a workman and a candle to look for it and sure enough they found it in a bathroom it had been escaping in a small closet at the end of the bath and not being able to get out for the door was a tight fit it had gone away and filled all the space between the ceilings and floors and between the lath and the pastor and the walls the moment the door in the bathroom was open all this gas took light and blowed up like gunpowder the whole inner skin of the beautiful drawing-room man was blowed into the middle of the room the cook who was in the drawing-room passage she was blowed downstairs the workman as opened the little door he was blowed flat on his back and the missus as was standing with her back to a door she was lifted off her legs and blowed right through the doorway into a bedroom gracious exclaimed the horrified mrs denman was she killed no ma'am she warn't killed be good luck she was only stunned and dreadful scared but no bones was broken mrs denman found relief in a sigh well ma'am continued joe let me advise you to keep your chimneys once a month when your chimney gets a fire the sparks they get out and when sparks get out of a windy night there's no tellin what they won't light up it's my opinion ma'am that them as makes the law should be no more double the fines for chimneys goin a fire but suppose ma'am your house gets alight in spite of you well then the question is what's best to do mrs denman nodded her old head six or seven times as though to say that is precisely the question 
i'll tell you ma'am here joe held up the forefinger of his right hand impressively in the first place every one in the house ought to know all the outs and ends of it cause if you got to look for things for the first time when the cry of fire is raised it's not likely that you'll find them now nah, do you know or do the servants know or does anybody in the house know where the trap in the roof is mrs denman appeared to meditate for a moment and then she said she was not sure she herself did not know and she thought the servants might be ignorant on the point but she rather thought there was an old one in the pantry but they had long kept a cat and so didn't require it ugh exclaimed joe with a broad grin sure it's a trap-door i'm spaking of mrs denman professed utter ignorance on this point and when told that it ought to be known to every one in the house as a mode of escape in the event of a fire she mildly requested to know what she would have to do if there were such a trap why get out on the roof to be sure mrs denman shivered and get along the tiles to the next house mrs denman shut her eyes and shuddered and so make your escape then you should have a ladder fixed to this trap-door so as it couldn't be took away and you should have some dozens fathoms of half-inch rope always handy cause if you was cut off from the staircase by fire and from the roof by smoke you might have to let yourself down from a windy it's as well too to know how to knot sheets and blankets together so that the ties won't slip for if you have no rope they'd be better than nothing you should also have a hand pump ma'am and a bucket of water always handy cause if you take a fire at the beginning it's easy put out and it's as well to know that you should go into a room on fire on your hands and knees with your nose close to the ground just as a pinter dog does cause there's more air there than overhead and it's bitter to go in with a hand pump the first thing don't wait to dress ma'am stop stop mr corney cried mrs denman holding up her hand the little lady was stunned with a rapid utterance of the enthusiastic fireman and with a dreadful suggestion that she mrs denman should in the dead of night get upon the roof of her dwelling and scramble over the tiles or let herself down by a rope from a window into the public street or creep into a burning room on her hands and knees with her nose to the ground like a pointer and all this too in her nightdress so she begged of him to stop and said but you forget fireman it is impossible for me to do any of these dreadful things well ma'am returned joe coolly twouldn't be easy though for the matter o' that it's wonderful what people will do for their lives but i was tellin ye ma'am what ought to be done so somebody else in the house might do it if you couldn't but suppose ma'am continued joe without waiting for a reply suppose that the house is alight well the first thing you've got to do not to get into a fluster i can't do no good you know and it's sure to do mischief keep cool that's the first thing ma'am and be deliberate in all you do the second thing is to wrap a blanket round ye and get out of the house as fast as ye can without stopping to dress it's of no use looking put out ma'am for it's better to escape without your clothes than to be burnt alive in em then be careful to shut all doors after ye as ye go this keeps the air from getting at the fire so smothers it down till the engines come up also keep all windows shut if the smoke is like to choke ye get your nose as near to the ground as possible and go along in your hands and knees a bit of flannel or a worsted sock held over your mouth and nose will help you to bear it better if you can't escape by the street door or the trap in the roof then get into a front room where you will be more easy to be got at with ladders or fire escapes and see that every member of the household is there many a one has been forgotten in the hurry scurry of a fire and left asleep in bed ignorant o the danger till too late when a cool head might have missed em and wakened em in time whatever ye do ma'am keep cool the probability of the horror mrs denman keeping cool in such circumstances was uncommonly small for she was at that moment hot all over and her face flushed at the mere recital of such horrors joe then went on to state that the very last thing she should do was to jump from a window a somewhat unnecessary piece of advice poor miss denman thought and that when she was compelled to take such a step she should first of all pitch over all the blankets and bedding she could lay a hold of to make her fall easy 
he wound up with an emphatic reiteration of the assurance that her only chance lay in keeping cool that night poor mrs denman in a condition of mind that is utterly indescribable because inconceivable went through the whole of the dreadful processes which joe had described and did it too with miraculous presence of mind and energy in her dreams End of chapter 18